shit, where's my background music? Oh, fuck. I had this all <laughs> where Very abrupt transition, which where? is like smash cut into this. Smash cut. I... Uh, uh, one, one second, guys. <laughs> there it is. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Under the Table, where I'm joined by some of the internet's most interesting personalities, and we will share some interesting drinks over even interesting discussions. My guest tonight is the one, the only, novelist from Nijisanji Ian's Luxium, and perhaps one of the most handsome men that I've ever had the honor of meeting, Mr. Ike Evelyn. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Vox. I think you nailed the introduction. I don't think there's much I can add to that other than, uh, I don't know, how interesting can I be? <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, I know you personally, and I know that you're a very interesting man with some interesting takes, some interesting uh, takes. Some interesting takes. Interesting mm. takes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can have plenty of interesting te takes, whether they're um, base takes or not, that, that's entirely up for discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that's up for chat to decide now. But, my first question, as always, for any of my guests, what are you drinking tonight? Ooh, I, right now, I have quite the assortment lined up. Uh, I have some Smirnoff Ice Double Black, because I think it tastes <sighs> like Red Bull, and I think Red Bull is pretty aight. And, but right now, I am having some sours mixed with Sprite and uh, two ice cubes to keep that uh, drink nice and cool. Very... Man really brought ice to this. Jesus, I've got... Mm, yeah, I, I don't know if you can hear it, like... <sighs> Tascaru ASMR. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> ISMR. <laughs> 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 if there's one thing that being a novelist does, it makes you very advanced at puns. Much to the dismay of my chat. <laughs> <laughs> they, we even have a specific emote where it's just like me looking incredibly done with life, and they always hit me with it whenever I make a pun. I think I've seen it. Yeah, I think I've hit you with that a couple times. But I don't know. To me, to, to, to me, to me, your puns always always give me a smile, even if they are pretty. I don't know what the word is. Infuriating. <laughs> But that's the thing about puns. If they don't make you roll your eyes, it's not really a pun, isn't it? That's true. Did you know that in um, in Shakespeare's day, puns were supposedly a mark of, um, like, intelligence? Like, if you were making puns all the time, it was like, wow, he's a true scholar. You know, and it was a very sort of, like, a form of high art to make puns back in the day. I wonder what happened. Hmm. I mean, Shakespeare was quite a while after me, I would wager, so... No, that's true, that's true. So, I mean, that's what you have to remember, guys. If you get upset for, uh, at Ike for making puns, he's only, you know, that's his time period. That's what he's drawing from. That's, to be fair, all the puns that I have picked up is in this time, uh, time period, so... <laughs> do, do, not, do not speak ill of my, <laughs> of my old country. <laughs> they are not responsible for the torture that you're about to endure. And... Well, torturous it may be, but I think you and me in particular are going to be having a lovely time just sharing a couple drinks. So, last time uh, last time I had Scala on, and she had the lovely idea of playing a drinking game. Well, what we do is we go through a series of questions, and we ask each other who, which of us is most likely to do the following. And if it applies to you, you take a drink. And obviously, whenever you feel like you've had, a, you've had enough, just let me know and we'll get onto some questions. So, I just need to go ahead and find some questions. Uh, what's it called? It sounds very lovely. Mm, I, I, I thought it was a really good idea on her part, so, you know, always... Um, I, think it's, I think it's an interesting part of... It's been the most interesting part of hosting a talk show is how much you learn from your guests. I think that... That's very true. Mm, streamers as a whole, we have this... Um, predilection to sort of be the center of attention, I guess, and to sort of say, oh, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is my stream, I need to be entertaining, but I think the fun part about a talk show is that it's, the focus isn't on you, it's on your guest, and it's... <laughs> no pressure. No pressure, yeah. No, everyone's <laughs> eyes are on you, and you have to be extremely entertaining, or everyone's gonna be really disappointed, okay? So I just have to imagine what it's like, um... It's like a full stream's length of whenever Selen Senpai leaves for a little bit and say, entertain chat. <laughs> Also, I, I went to go look for um, most likely two questions, and I googled it as who would do this, and Google autocorrected it to the meme, and so I just saw a load of pictures of Eric Andre shooting a dude. Oh, <laughs> it took me a second to know what you were trying to think about. Who would do such a thing? It sort of remind. Uh, it's sort of like kind of similar to that one meme with the guy riding a bike and shoving like an iron pole into the front wheel, so he falls and hurts himself, and then he blames something entirely different than his own actions. <laughs> okay, 
Uh, I've got a good one to start you with, and I already know it's it's sort of cruel because I already know that this one applies mostly to you. But, oh boy! Um, which of us would be most likely to win a Grammy? Hmm. Well, the thing is, I don't think that you've fully shown your power level when it comes to that. Really? Oh, I mean. Yeah, because. Where what I I possess knowledge that Chad doesn't like. All they have to go off of is little crumbs in your streams from time to time, and your unarchived unarch karaoke, your legendary unarchived yeah, unarchived karaoke <laughs> from back in the day. But I am sitting on knowledge from karaoke booths, and let mm -hmm. me tell you, you guys haven't seen anything. <laughs> listen, listen. They, they, they've they've heard they've. They, They've heard enough. They have heard me singing Elvis, and I don't know if you hear that voice note that Mister posted. I don't know if it sounds. I don't know if it sounds as good as you guys are making me think it believes. Okay, I listened to that myself. I was like, oh, yeah, but that's just a snippet, like a t tiny snapshot of time uh, out of an entire evening. And throughout that entire evening, I was surprised, genuinely. Like I was taken aback because, like, I had your karaoke to sort of base my expectations off of but i was not ready for what transpired in that karaoke booth i was you two you blew me away with a lot of the things that you pulled off in there so get in front of that microphone and let me mix for you dang it <laughs> didn't expect didn't expect, didn't expect to be tearing up 10 minutes in god damn Why all right fair crying? enough huh? Fair enough. No, I'm 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 joshing you, but that 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 does mean a lot to me. But you you have um I know you've like obviously, you know it's like I I appreciate it all, but like at the same time I think that you're you, there is so much more musically that you have left to show everybody. You know, it's like there there is strange sort of um you know obviously it's difficult to be making music all the time. A good song like an original or a a cover takes a long time to make. But I mean we've heard this man. We've heard this man bust out his pipe so many times, multiple karaoke streams, the Kronos cover, and everything else. And I imagine you're probably oh, yes, working Kronos. on a lot of things behind the scenes as well. I'm... Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> uh, Actually, I... you do. You do. You, if anybody would know. Mm, well, I, I, I know. I know about a few. I know about a few things, but obviously, shh, mum's the word, eh, guys? Best, yeah. best shh, not spoil shh, shh, shh. So for me personally. All right, why don't we both just take a drink? All right, let's just let's. Yeah, um, let's, let's, let's take a let's, let's take, take, a, take a drink. Cheers. Mm. Ooh. Ooh Ooh. I Ooh, that is good. <laughs> I look back at the questions, and the first one that I saw was who is most likely to live the longest, and I was like, all right, well, that's not fair. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that's not fair. I am but a boy. <laughs> this is just a scribbly boy, and I am a, I am a, I am a creature of um, prolonged life. This is, this is definitely not a fair question to ask. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, this is an interesting one. Who is most likely to move to their own farm in the countryside? Ooh. I think my money would be on you because I would feel... I, I, you strike me as the kind of person that once you have achieved your goal and you have rebuilt your empire and you're passing the torch onto your successor, if there ever is one, because I don't know how long your demons live for, you would just retire to a little farm to just sort of do your own thing, vibe, tend to your crops, and enjoy nature. That sounds really nice, actually, yeah. Uh, what about, I mean, what about you? I mean, surely that has to be a successor to your, to your lineage as well, someone to take up the pen, whereas mine would take up the sword. What would I you do? I think my successor will not be somebody who is involved with me uh, in the literal sense, I think my successor would just be somebody inspired by my works, and I would be happy with that. I admire that. I admire that. I mean, I agree, right? I think I would be a Thanos type, where as soon as I've done all of my conquesting and all of my snapping business, I would just retire to a, to a farm, wear my little Homer Simpson shirt, cook soup, and be like, and I finally rest and look upon a grateful universe. But... I'm wondering, that is an interesting question. I mean, obviously I'll take a drink, because mm. I guess that applies to me. But Plus, I, I think that the internet has spoiled me. Ever since I arrived in this time period, I kind of got addicted. <laughs> I don't know if I could <laughs> live in a, on a farm without internet connection. No, that's fair. But that does raise an interesting question. If you did have to retire and you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? 
Mm, that's a good question. Um, uh, actually, it wouldn't be on a farm, but I think that the Japanese countryside is breathtaking. Mm, very true. I I I, th I think that wouldn't that doesn't sound too bad actually. And, and I, I I remember seeing this one story time video from this YouTuber I really like where he was uh, talking about uh, traveling with trains in the big city versus the countryside. And the big city is just like constant like loudness of sort of shimmying your way through people, like apologizing every time you bump into someone. And then in the countryside, it's just sort of waiting, looking around. There's no train inside. And then it's just, he just asks like an old lady just kind of sitting there. Excuse me, when's the train come? Yeah, it's coming in another 50 minutes. <laughs> and he's just having like this sort of nonsensical conversation back and forth with this uh, lovely, lovely old lady. And then it says like, like, what was it? Like four, uh, 49 minutes and 30 uh, seconds later. And then he's like, oh, the train's coming. I'm like, yep, that's Japanese punctuality for you. <laughs> just like right on time. <laughs> Yeah, God. I mean, having having lived in in a larger city for a while now, I definitely sort of this is what I appreciate the most at the moment. You know, given this stage in my life, but there's nothing quite like the countryside, and there's nothing quite like a small little town with little charms. You know, I used to know a friend who lived in a village which had four houses, one of which was his, a water pump, and a pub, and that was it. That was it. That was literally the entire village. Yeah, and I. I went to visit him for a while, and I loved it. I imagine it would get really exhausting after a while. Well, not exhausting, but very sort of like dull after a while with not much to do. But mm. I mean, if your life is way too busy and if you need to get away, I can't imagine somewhere better than that. Just somewhere where the, everyone knows each other, you know? The kind of place where they give you a welcome wagon when you move in, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my gosh, I couldn't... Uh, hmm. I guess there are different, like, sort of more... Like modern ways to sort of think about that not quite but when you think about it uh dorms and campuses are sort of like that they're kind of like mm. little villages or i don't know conglomerate might be the wrong word but I mean, it, eventually you just sort of start to know who everybody is everybody knows everybody yeah when i went to university there was a um uh, like, the, like I didn't go there, but one of the accommodations you could stay in was literally called the Student Village, and it was just like a net of houses that all of the all the students shared and lived in, and it was like, yeah, like really? the, it's a very social environment, especially because if you just if you get a, a shared flat, then it means you just yeah you're stuck with five other people who are there, and you've got to make friends or else it's gonna suck, you know, and then yeah. it, it sort of becomes a whole thing. I mean, good for some, but maybe not as good for other people, you know. I was I was kind of lucky in the um, with getting my own dorm room. It wasn't big by any stretch of the imagination or any, anything like that. But I liked that it was sort of like a tiny little town mm. that that was just com comprised of nothing but students. But like we had we had nice stuff there. We had like a big food court. We had like a supermarket. We even had like a theater that played like new movies and everything. I remember ju just like watching like movies that were brand new and i didn't even have to because you, back then you usually just say oh my god when is it dropping on streaming and everything i could just go there and it was like really really nice well that sounds that sounds really really nice jesus yeah i and it was almost it, it wasn't very popular either so usually i had almost you know, well, not, it was always like a few people because a lot of people had the same idea as me but i just sort of sat down there almost entirely empty i had some popcorn with me they were drenched in butter i had a big soda and i was just having a ball with it it was great oh you're making me hungry now oh god i haven't had yeah like i was thinking about actually running back uh, running uh, down and like getting some popcorn but unfortunately uh, we, we were running out of time and we needed to <laughs> we needed to take this stream we needed to take you to get it started i mean listen Usually these shows go on for about three hours, so if you get to a point where you're feeling really hungry, because obviously having a bit of food in your stomach helps with alcohol, so if you need to excuse yourself at any time to go and grab some pophead corn, feel free to let me know. Pophead sure corn. I'm, I'm sure everyone will understand. I, I don't think I have any micropop at home, unfortunately. I do um, have like an old bag of cheese doodles I haven't finished, but the thing with me and cheese doodles, I don't like them stale, which is why whenever I don't finish a bag in one go, I sort of uh, grab one of these plastic clasps, you know, mm -hmm. 
and just sort of seal it as airtight as I can. But even as airtight as I can seal it, if it's been there for a while, they are gonna go stale to mm, some extent. Yeah. So if I and that thing has been there for a while, so if I open that right now, they're gonna be really, really stale and chewy. I get the same thing. I mean, after you know, like living alone and like being so busy with streaming and stuff, like the last of my worries is how old the shit in my fridge is. Like every time, <laughs> I don't, I don't keep like a fucking Excel spreadsheet with the sell by dates on it. I will just look in my fridge, be like, what have I got? Oh, that looks bad, and then I throw it out if it looks like it's gone <laughs> bad. You know. I'm very paranoid about expiration dates, so I always check that stuff. Uh, I mean, I check them. Like, before I cook, I'll always check them if I if I didn't get them, like, on the same day. But at the same time, it's like, I'm not gonna remember, oh, shit, the salmon in my fridge has gone off, time to throw it out. I'll just be like, oh, I can have some salmon. Oh, fuck, it's gone off. You know, and then that's... Mm. The... <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's really bad. But anyway, I did see a really interesting question that I'd like to ask you. Mm. Who of us is the most likely, and I feel like this applies to both, but who is more likely to cry during a sad movie? I feel like that would be me. I cry very easily. <laughs> I cry very, very easily. What are some movies Heck, that have made you cry? Um, one of the ones that's the worst that I can recall is Marley and Me. Oh, 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 you didn't have to bring up that movie. Oh. That one. Ouch. That that was that was brutal. That was pretty bad. Hmm. I I know uh, that there's a um hmm? there's a website now which is literally just does the dog die? And so if yeah, you're very I sensitive know, to that kind die? of thing, you can look it up and be like, Alright, I'm gonna watch a movie, but it has a dog in it, alright, let me check. And if you don't and it will tell you, yeah, no, you don't wanna watch this. It'll tell you whether or not you should watch it based on how attached you are to the idea mm. of the dog living. I actually like, I think they've expanded a little bit recently to include like um, additional like um, content warnings for people who mm. might be sensitive to certain heavy subject matters, oh, that's which I think is really cool. cool. Mm. Yeah, it's always um, it's always a challenge when you do a, a watch along. And I know that you, you, know, you and I are big sort of um, horror fans. And mm. what we wind up doing often is that I'll just like wait for someone in chat to give me like a detailed list of content warnings. And I'm like, ah, yes, thank you. I would not have known. And it'll be like, oh, God, that's bad. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. That's bad. All right. Let me list those. But it's interesting that there's a website that has those um, uh, specifically now. That's good. I should look that up. Hmm. Uh, the thing with me and content warnings is uh, I think that they're great. Uh, I think that pe and people who are who are aware of the fact that they are sensitive to certain subject have like a um, information resource that allows them to look that stuff up. Uh, but even though I have things that I am sensitive to and, and like going beyond just the phobia that I am known for, mm -hmm. when I when I go into something, I always have this sort of, I guess it's a little bit like an obsession of experiencing the movie the way that the author intended it. And if the author didn't put content warnings or anything, or anything that's giving a heads up of something that's going to happen, they didn't want me to know about that going in. So that's how I'm meant to experience it. And sometimes it backfires, but most of the times it's sort of, I'm looking for the intended experience, whatever that might be. And sometimes, you, you know, for example, like I don't like bells whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I don't sort of expect the world to cater to what I uh, struggle with. It's more so that I gotta learn how to cope m myself because the, my my safety and uh, like mental well being while experiencing media in any way, shape, or form shouldn't really be the responsibility of the author. The only uh, their only responsibility is to tell a compelling story. Whether or not I'm comfortable doing that ride is entirely up to me, me and my self discipline. I never thought you could get more based. Oh. <laughs> but I, I, I have the exact same opinion on these kind of things. Like, I have, th you know, like you have church bells, I have stuff for me that, like, you know, gets me and stuff like that. But I completely agree that when you watch a film, it should be, or film, TV, whatever, it should be experienced in the way that the artist who created it intended it to be experienced. And for my money, mm. that is always in a dark room, with sound that envelops you and from start to finish without pausing it. And I mm -hmm. also agree that spoilers, and I'm very passionate about this, spoilers are 
a, a, a more amoral action than than cold-blooded murder. Because if you think about it, right? If you spoil a movie, the person who hears that spoiler will never be able to experience that film or that work of art or whatever it is in its original form ever. It has been permanently altered for them. And art has the power to change a person's life, right? You know, it has the power to completely alter the cult, the course at which they live their life. And all, all it takes is you doing saying, oh yeah, this guy dies at the end, for that person to not have that experience. You know, so that actually happened to me with a certain show. I got three episodes in, then somebody said, like, "Oh, you're watching that show? Oh, I really love it. it." Made me so sad when this character died. I'm like, "Thanks for that. Thank you." For I didn't that. know that yeah. they died. Yeah, no, my my personal trainer spoiled um, a, a number of deaths from Attack on Titan recently, which I still haven't oh, seen. Oh God! Seasons. I haven't seen seasons two through four, and I think he was getting me back because I accidentally spoiled. Um, a certain character appearance in Star Wars for him, which I didn't think was a big deal. Uh, so I think he might have been getting revenge on me, which is fair enough. Um, mm. But it's still, you know, I think it's a very... In it's sort of down to the individual, right? You know, if you're a very sensitive person, it's good that content warnings are out there, but I like the fact that it's, like, never included in... Um, it's never included, like, when you look up a movie, it's never saying, oh, includes this stuff in this much detail, because... You know, uh, that's be... not entirely true, though, because there are movie ratings. It mm. said, like, oh, uh, rated, rated M for um, graphic violence and uh, mature language and stuff like that. So that's technically content warnings. I guess it is, but it's vague enough that it doesn't give you specific warnings. It doesn't warnings spoil of... you. Exactly. You know, there are some times where, you know, I'll be doing a watch along for a film I haven't seen and someone will say, oh, yeah, this includes, like, parental death and I'm like oh well like, now I know the parents die or like one of the parents dies you know and it's like well I understand that might be sensitive for some people and you should have the ability to look that up it's like it's still I choose like even if it's going to upset me I would love to go in sort of blind because it's like I said during my debut like when a film makes me feel sad successfully that makes me leave feeling happy because the artistry of something that makes you feel a specific emotion is so like powerful that I leave things like, wow, that's cool, you know? And so, you know, mm. that's that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Especially because a lot of the stories that I enjoy are the ones that tend to be very dark and contain very mm. upsetting things. And I want those things, like when those things happen, I want them to hit. If I'm sitting there, and asking myself, when is this going to happen? I'm not going to be able to feel like the the uh, intended impact of it when it actually does occur. Mm. For example, uh, if whether that be like a, a shock and revelation, a, a character death or anything like that, when that happens, I want it to surprise me. That's why I hate when uh, there are these like lists that are like, oh, top 10 movies that have a twist that change everything. And I see like one just title on that. Even if I don't read anything about the movie, I just see that, oh, this movie has a twist. So I'm going to sit there the entire movie just wanting myself uh, to myself, okay, so what's the twist? When are they going to drop it on Yeah. Me? And I'm gonna not, be, not going to be able to think about anything like it besides that. It's one of the reasons why I'm never able to watch M. Night Shyamalan movies anymore. <laughs> yeah, because as soon as you know it's M. Night, it's like, well, well, when is the twist happening? And you're just sort of waiting for it. And the plot itself is going past you and you're like, but, but where's the twist though? But where's the yeah. twist? Ugh. I love movies that do have twists, though. God, I'm thinking I about I know. Some. I love myself some twists. And it makes me even sadder when uh, people decide to, like, give those away just because it's, uh, like, uh, it's famous. Like, one of the most famous plot twists of all time is everybody knows it right now because of how iconic it is. And nobody's ever going to get the shock. Let me guess. Uh, that Six cents. Mm -hmm. No. Really? But that, but that's up there. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the Empire Strikes Back. Oh, oh no, that that is an even more iconic example. No, you're so right. But one thing that I love, I've seen parents who are showing their uh, their kids Star Wars for the first time, who don't really have an online presence, doesn't know much about it, and they get to that point and see, the, seeing the genuine shock of somebody that doesn't know that it's coming. It's kind of magical. I 
Oh, no, I completely agree. And it's one of the things that makes me really, really excited for um, Elira's Lord of the Rings watch along that she's going to do um, at some point. I'm not sure when it is. I think it's next week. I am going to be there from start to fucking finish because I love Lord of the Rings so much. And even though, like, I don't know if you could really classify much of Lord of the Rings as having twists per se, but, like, there are so many great moments and so many things that... I watched Lord of the Rings when I was young, like young, 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 young. And so, and I, I think I had friends like spoil a lot of it for me, but it was still mm. like su such an interesting experience. The first film of its kind that I ever saw, you know, something of that length and so many of them, it's mm. like, it's so interesting to imagine what it must be like to watch a film like that with zero understanding of what it's like. Because like you were saying, Star Wars is so culturally significant, especially in the, and I know it's like um, in in Eastern countries, it's not as big, but in the West, in America, and like um, Europe, the UK, Star Wars is massive and huge, even huge. bigger when it was coming out. So influential on like the the direction cinema was taking at the time. I mean, the current scape of um, of cinema with Marvel, DC, whatever, like cinematic universes, you can trace all of that back. Blockbuster culture began with Star Wars, and mm. well. Mm. I think blockbuster culture started with Jaws, if I'm going to be honest. I was thinking Jaws as well, yeah. I mean, Jaws is... No, no, that's that, 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 that's that, that's a good I think that's well. at, at least I think it's the first movie to use the word, like, blockbuster as to market itself. Mm, I love Jaws. Jaws is freaking fantastic, by the way. I haven't mm. seen it in a hot minute. I always think of, uh, when I think of Jaws, I think of the one shot, like, right before they're about to go and find the shark. Like, the shot that travels through the Jaws, like, the like the mounted Jaws in the house, like, the trophy and the camera just travels mm. through them. I was like, this is one of those things you don't really forget about. And um, it's always an interesting story to think about, you know, a director like Steven Spielberg, who, we, who now, household name, everyone knows who Steven Spielberg is, how that was just like humble beginnings for him. I don't know if you've seen many yeah. uh, many of his like like films that came before Jaws, like Duel. That's a really that's a, that's a really I have not one. seen that. I, I I the oldest Spielberg movies I've seen is like um Jaws and um Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Mm, both both bo both very very good. And uh, it's not as old, but ET is one that I have a lot of nostalgia for as well. Oh yes, ET. That I mean full circle, that's a movie that makes me cry. God. It's a very, very emotional journey. That brings me to something. What are your opinion? Uh, like, I'm kind of curious because I see some people split on this. What do you think about re-releases that revise parts of movies? Even if it's just like updating, like, for example, like updating uh, like certain scenes with uh, improved matte paintings or replacing practical effects with uh, modern CGI. Hmm. So are you talking about like... Um... A full-blown remake or sort of a remaster? No, 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 no. Like, uh, I know when E.T. got released on, I, I don't know if it was VHS or DVD, they replaced a lot of the practical shots with a CGI E.T. They also mm. had a scene with um, uh, where uh, there were police, well, you know, when they fly off on bikes, police officers were holding shotguns. They replaced them with walkie-talkies. I am 100% against this. Ooh, I, I see. am I am extremely upset with the fact that the biggest example of this are the Star Wars special editions. The mm -hmm. Star Wars that released in 1977 is wildly different from well not wildly but there are so many different scenes and different shots in the special editions that I think actively worsen the experience. Have you ever seen the special edition of Return of the Jedi? Yes, I have. With the fucking Jabba's palace scene, with the weird concert mm. that happens. It's like, I feel as though film is, it needs to be preserved. And I think that even though I find digital camera work to be, in a lot of ways, inferior to uh, sort of celluloid camera work, digital is the greatest medium that we have for preserving film. If a film is released digitally, it will never fade over time and one of the biggest like cultural disasters i think one of the biggest cultural disasters i think is celluloid from maybe a hundred years ago is actively fading like it's becoming of less and less quality and it is more difficult mm. to watch now because physically the film itself is decaying you know that's why we have lost movies and lost media 
it, and whatnot. It, it's it's insane that that is something that can happen. But I believe that when a film is released, anyone who wants to should be able to see it in the original form that it was released. But so few people who watch Star Wars will see it in the original way that it was shot. And Star because there's War- no yeah. good way to watch it. The, the last official release of the original version of Star Wars was. Um, and I know this because I got Return of the Jedi on DVD. I got there's the special edition, and you got like an extra bonus disc with the unaltered original th- theatrical version. But that thing has a lot of problems in and of itself, where the resolution isn't great, and they also removed the noise with an automatic process that caused a lot of motion smearing and just mm. it, it, it doesn't look great. But that's still the only, like, the best quality official release that we have of the original Star Wars. The, the whole thing with... I think that some of the changes made to movies, be it Star Wars or E.T. or anything else, they can sometimes be a little bit cool. Like, I like how the the changes to Return of the Jedi sort of tied in the prequels by showing Coruscant and Naboo and all that stuff. It sort of made it feel like a whole experience if you're showing it to, like from episodes one through six to maybe like young people who have never experienced Star Wars. I think that's kind of cool. As long as the original unaltered version is available on a in a format that is on a level playing field. And with Star Wars, that just isn't the case. No, I, as sad as it is. I agree with you completely. Like, personally for me, I found like the additional scenes at the end of Return of the Jedi, you know, showing Coruscant and all that kind of stuff. Me personally, I found them kind of tacky, but I can understand how they sort of add a bit of um, storybookiness, like, you know, showing references to things that only were able to exist after the original was created. And with George Lucas's vision, the reason that he started with episode four rather than episode one is that he knew he wanted to create Coruscant and he said himself, the technology just isn't there yet. So I'm going to make episodes four through six and then later I'll make one, two, three when the, when the, when the, you know, when the technology is in a place where it works. So I think that in his vision, that would work. But I think that the main difference is every film that has changes made should be available for ev- should be a- very clearly available. And the best example of this is Lord of the Rings. The theatrical cut is easy to access, and the extended cut is clearly labeled and also easy to find. Both of them are valid ways of watching the film, although the extended cuts are better. And if you watch Lord of the Rings, you should watch the extended cut. But I'm not here to tell anyone what to do. <laughs> mm. You know. I think there's a really good example where both are available and both are easy to find, you know. I think that's great. And uh, that also reminds me, another um, incredibly important movie for cinema that is these days not available in like a format that is on par with uh, the, uh, like the quality or the resolution or whatever have you that of the edited version. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Evil Dead. Mm. Evil Dead is such an important movie for the horror genre. And that is because of all the struggles that they went through in the process of making it and all the goofiness, all the campiness that comes with it. You can literally see like uh, staff hiding in the bushes in certain scenes in the original. And that's like, it adds to the experience. That's what makes Evil Dead, Evil Dead. But in the bl- current like HD Blu-ray scans of it, they've gone in and they have edited out people uh, like the staff like hiding in the bushes or any of the mistakes when you show like a hand or something that isn't supposed to be seen there. And she's like, no, that was in the original version. That's what made people like this. That it makes it campy, makes it sort of ridiculous. It's it's what made Evil Dead, Evil Dead, and it changed the landscape of horror forever. You gotta have that in there. If you go in there, you're changing history, and I have a massive, massive issue with that. I couldn't agree more. It reminds me so much of, um, I learned a lot recently about Grindhouse, which was a really interesting oh my era in American gosh. cinema. I love Grindhouse, and yes. I remember learning about it through, um, what is it? A good, a good starting point is, uh, Oh, what's it called? The Tarantino movie uh, about oh, the um, car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, D- deep, deep impact. No, it's called that's not De- it. it's called Death Something. It's called Death Proof. That's it. Death, Death Proof. Proof. That's the one. That's the one. So, I'm gonna go on my soapbox here for a sec. For those of you who don't know, Grindhouse was named after a cinema that you could go to in America, and grind and going to the Grindhouse 
was a wildly different experience than going to a regular cinema. The Grindhouse was a cinema with cheap tickets that showed cheap, violent-ass, controversial horror movies that had just anything in them. They were immensely violent, full of sex, drugs, everything, just every adult thing that you could imagine. And people who went to the, uh, went to the Grindhouse, they didn't... They didn't, like you know, sit down and want to experience the film, like, sort of all quiet and everything. There were people fucking in the back row, everyone was drunk, everyone was smoking and shouting and throwing shit, and it was just... It wasn't wrong, in a way, because that's what the Grindhouse was. If you went to the Grindhouse, you knew what you were getting into. And ever since then, filmmakers have been trying to interpret that B-movie style of filmmaking. And Death Proof is a really good example of Tarantino being inspired by that ridiculous era of cinema that inspired so many different cinemas like it to pop up in the nearby area. I believe it was in New York City, the Grand House, but whatever. It's like, it's a really interesting sort of era in cinema where everything was like different from what you would expect. It's trashy, it's violent, it's full of alcohol and just shit and piss and cum everywhere all over the walls and you just went in there and you enjoyed it for what it was and you know Evil Dead, Evil Dead is definitely sort of um it made in like it, it's cut from the same cloth certainly hmm yeah I'm like I see what you mean it's definitely that's the thing about cinema it has so many different like avenues and styles to it and i think that even if uh, sort of something like that is a time gone by that fact that people are still sort of paying homage to the style i think that's kind of neat and whenever that homage or the style whenever a movie is going to evoke a certain thing and people don't get that they sort of get upset uh, like a great example i can think about is frank darabont's the mist if you've seen that movie i don't think i have no oh my gosh okay so the mist is a stephen king story and um, the mist was heavily criticized for uh, having a sort of cheesy sto story with like monsters and uh, like the um, like cheap effects like looking a little bit ridiculous the, the designs of the monsters were sort of felt like, oh, like something you would see out of like uh, the black and whites, like or silent movie era. But here's the thing. Frank Darabont specifically wanted the movie to be released in black and white because that's the whole thing that he was going for. He was going for that black and white era. And when you, uh, they, the studio just sort of said, no, people are not gonna go and watch a black and white movie. You have to release it in color. So what was he supposed to do? He, he just sort of agreed with it. But on the special edition Blu-ray, there is a version of the like of the disc that has the black and white version. And it's you would think that, oh, it's just swap, swap, whopping the footage to black and white. It's not going to change anything. No, it's a completely different experience because you get the feeling of what they were going for. It is that cheesy sort of monster movie from back in the day before color it, the, the effects even look kind of better but even when they look bad it feels appropriate and all the performances so there's so many great actors that are working well below their pay grade in that movie just because they want to work with frank darabont because people like the stuff that he makes they they know that he is passionate they know that he makes good stuff so the performances in that movie are fantastic across the board and it's just oh I'm so sad that the black and white version isn't more widely known because when people think The Mist, people sort of remember a sort of subpar movie that they didn't really like all that much because they watched the color version. It's a completely different experience to watch it in black and white. And I, again, I don't know how you could possibly get more based, but you become more based with every passing minute. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, one of my favorite movies of all time, and indeed probably my second favorite horror movie after Under the Skin, is The Lighthouse. And it's a very recent um, expression of that, where at the I I've read the screenplay, and at the very beginning of the screenplay, on the first page, it says, This film will be shot on black and white film in a 1 by 1.1 aspect ratio. And it is e essential to the experience. And it's so true, because the film is shot in that and, and in scenes with lots of light it still feels claustrophobic because of the cramped sort of like horizontal letterbox but then in darker scenes the darkness bleeds into the rest of the screen and then the the black on the sides you barely notice it anymore and it's 
it's a completely different experience that it, that I imagine people with experience with black and white film understand really, really well. But anyone who watches it will get why it is shot in that way, and it gives it such a unique feeling. And I think it's a fucking tragedy that studios have the power to sit down and say, no, this artistic decision is too out there, this needs to make money, change it. And then the film loses what makes it special. I think that that really kills stuff. Especially when films are meant to be long and they're edited in post to be short, you know? Mm. I, I, I think it kills films. And we're, like it happens a lot with fantasy, you know, new fantasy franchises that would have had legs to run their wings are clipped when they say, no, people aren't going to watch this if it's too long. Cut it to under two hours. And when we remember the greatest fantasy films ever made, A Lord of the Rings, that each one is three hours and 30 minutes. Bare fucking minimum. Yeah. And it... Okay, I, I don't know if you're going to behead me for this, but I have never watched A Lord of the Rings. Hey, you've got a chance to next week. You've got a chance to sit through every single one. And I will tell you, <laughs> by the end, you will, you will have fallen in love. I don't think I've ever met someone. People's opinion on Lord of the Rings, it's either I love it to death, they're the best films I've ever seen and they change my life, or I haven't seen them. The thing is, it's not that I haven't seen it, I have tried. I have tried to watch The Fellowship four times and I have fallen asleep every single time. And it's not because I, I'm, it's not because I, I want to diss the movie, it's just, I, it's just really difficult for me to be attentive for that long but if it means anything i did listen to the audiobook of the hobbit well it's a start i, like I mean listen i listen i was okay 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 i i understand it's a common experience to fall asleep during lord of the rings but if you sit there and you make yourself get through the the first film is really good still if you get through the whole thing and you learn, and you like sort of just let it do what it's trying to do, you will, like, I mean, you will love it. Okay, it's such a unique experience, and you will get so attached to every character, and you will be so involved in the world, and so interested in the events going on. I don't know how many spoilers you've had about the various different events, but if you haven't had many, then it's going to be an experience unlike any other, because so much happens in those films that makes it interesting and just bizarre as an experience to watch i i, I would feel like i've experienced a lot of spoilers for like really famous moments but one thing that hasn't been spoiled for me is the ending i have no idea how lord of the rings like any well, of the movies end well that's why you gotta watch it that's why you gotta check it out you gotta see what happens at the end you know i feel like i shouldn't do that speaking of that this going back to the hobbit for a second you know what's a severely underrated video game the hobbit for gamecube and ps2 i have Holy not played crap. that tell me about oh it. my god my dude you um you gotta you, you gotta start making your way through some like um vintage or not really vintage that's a bit much but like but like all classic games holy crap the hobbit for gamecube and ps2 slaps it is so good it has no business being as good as it is Oh my god. Look at those graphics. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. So charming. Oh, so freaking charming. That looks charming. It reminds me of when I was playing... I never really got too into it, but I remember a, f a good decade or so ago I was playing... What is it? Lord of the Rings Online? You know? That's... Oh my god. Yeah. That was a thing? That was a... Yeah! It was like a pretty low-key MMO. Not many people played it, but it was a thing for a while. Is it still live? Hang on. That's a good question. There's a lot of MMOs that I still wonder, like, are they still alive? Because I feel like all the hype and the player base must have dwindled to something to the point where it's incredibly niche. But sometimes that stuff is still up because the devs keep it up for the people that sank thousands of hours into that and are still passionate about it. Hang on a minute. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm just Googling it now, and there's, like, people are speculating that Lord of the Rings Online will be shut down eventually, but I don't know if it's been confirmed. It seems fine. I kind of want to play that game again now. I'm getting nostalgic. But Aww. it was like World of Warcraft, but set in Middle-earth, and very sort of janky with sort of PS2-style graphics, and... Oh, it's 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 a really nice thing when not only... Because a lot of movies have tie-in games. Like, I remember... 
I actually that, the other day that doesn't happen anymore, does it? It really doesn't, does it? Like back in the day, every movie that came out, especially every kids movie, like every animated movie, had a tie-in game. And I remembered one that I played was Kung Fu Panda for PS2. Oh my god! I played that one, and that I remember. I saw a long play that was only three hours long, and I'm like, "Bitch, this game took me like 20 hours to beat. I was so lost." Like, but you look back at it, and it and yeah, there was a time when every movie had a tie-in game. And nowadays, you know, it's interesting to see a film like Lord of the Rings that has so many adaptations. I mean, book like Lord of the Rings, but most people, I think, are inspired by the films. You've got Shadow of Mordor. You've got that new Gollum stealth game that's coming out. You've got... what now? Have you not heard about the Gollum video game? I have not heard anything about that. There is a video game just called Gollum that is a... that is a stealth video game. And it's coming out eventually. And Gollum doesn't look like Gollum. He looks like a weird sort of bootleg Gollum. And it's really weird. It's coming out. It's coming out this year. What? Ooh. I didn't even know. I thought it was ah. coming out like indeterminately in the future. But no, Lord of the Rings Gollum is coming out in a while. And it's like a stealth game where you have to hide and make your way through Mordor and survive and some shit. Like there's so it's like there's so much has been sort of drawn from the from from this game from this film book whatever it is sorry i'm drunk uh, <laughs> <laughs> speaking it's, of time ga- in games that uh, i love playing the, and playing this game uh, <laughs> uh, no pun intended but time games are sort of notorious for being made on the cheap not a lot of time like poor developers are being crunched out the wazoo and the quality sort of reflects that but What are some tying games that were genuinely good that you can think of? I am about to get on my soapbox again. Oh boy. The best tying games of all time are the SpongeBob video games. How how many SpongeBob games have you played? Two. Which ones? uh, Okay, I need to look up the title for the second one because I only know it in Swedish. (laughs) <laughs> because they actually dubbed that game over here, so that shocked me. <laughs> That's interesting. But the first one is Battle for Bikini Bottom. And that one I was Based. very, very, very fond of. Yes, Battle for Bikini Bottom is the one that got a remake. It's by far the, the most famous. It has a speedrunning community. What the heck? Uh, what do you call? I I need to look at a list. Of SpongeBob I can. I'll, video I'll games, reel off some I names. Know. Hold on. Uh, SpongeBob games. It was like a party game. Lights, where... camera, pants. It, is that the one? Was it like movie themed? It was like it had like um, basically. They were making a um, Mermaid Man and... Uh... <gasps> That's Lights, Camera, Pants! That was the first one I played! I can't yeah, believe Lights, you played Camera that Pants. too! I think that's the one! That used to be my favorite game. I had that on my PS2. It was like a genuinely great party game with a plot and like a campaign yeah, yeah. And, and everything. Yeah, if you won the video games, you got the role in that scene with the character you were playing. It was like they had the, they had like the hammerhead shark. It was like, yes, I'm the director. We need someone to play the super villain and all of that. And you would go in and what try to like- What was his name in English? I o- This game I played entirely in Swedish. I only know the Swedish names for Light, it. Uh, lights. Camera pants, hammerhead shark. Like, not not the hammerhead shark. It, like, what what was the super villain? This, oh, the the, the, the Mel, God, I, I'm trying to literally translate his name in my head right now, and I know that it's gonna be wrong. Okay, the villain in the lights, camera pants, the movie is called the sneaky hermit. The sneaky hermit. In Swedish, he was called Lumskaeremiten, which L- Lumskaeremiten. <laughs> Oh, that was pretty good! Thank you! Holy crap! Sheesh! Hold on, I'm pouring myself yeah, some uh, one, well, the, the thing I did the first time around is just I won every single video game, so I was playing a Spongebob. Spongebob played almost every single role, including the main villain. <laughs> 
But then I went through another time and I had like a multi-tap and I had four controllers and I made sure that the characters that I thought was the most suitable for the part won that so I could sit through the entire thing and just have fitting characters for like the different roles that they were playing. It was incredibly obsessive on me, but it was so much fun. I can't believe I've met another human being who's played this game. This is this is amazing. I I was obsessed with this and like I remember I was so bad at it when I first got it and I was only getting bronze medals and I remember first time I got a silver medal I was like oh and I, it's like mm. and it, it sort of I don't know why this felt at the time, it felt deeper than other party games. And you had all the different characters, like Plankton, who was in his mech suit. And I remember, what yeah, is it, the yeah, band yeah. minigame? Where you got to, where you got, where you had like, like the rhythm game, where all the different characters are in a band? I'm gonna be honest, a lot of the things have faded from my memory, but I remember that the first mem uh, the first thing uh, that I remember, the first minigame was when you were flinging burger across the room yes! and your partner had to be under them when they landed in order for them to like get knocked into like the order for the customers. I'm gonna send you a screenshot from that exact mini game. I wanna send you back. I wanna send you back years send me into back. the past. Send me back, my dude. Looking, uh, looking, looking collab VC right now. That's the one! That's the one! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I, I need to dig this out somehow. One thing that I've been wanting to do for a long time, I've been trying to get my hands on like the best setup for a PlayStation 2 to stream. Like I'm, I've been looking for like PS2 slims that have component cables that I can put into like a hardware like scan line upscaler or something to sort of get it in a, an acceptable quality and everything so I can have like the most pristine play PlayStation 2 image imaginable while streaming because I want to go through so many nostalgic uh, PS2 games. It's ridiculous. I want to go through all the different like PS2 Silent Hill games. I want to see if I can go through Rule of Rose. Oh my God, I want to go through the Ratchet and Clank series. Oh. Holy crap. What? Tell me about some games you played on PS2 because I had a PS2 and that was oh like my, my console of choice for a long time. It was that and the okay. DS Lite that I had. Okay, so Ratchet and Clank, I played the ever-living heck out of. Mm. I played a lot of... The, the, the one, what I love about the PS2 era is it had a ton of Japanese passion projects. They were like weird experimental things that just for some reason received budget and they were allowed to make it. And it led to some of the most interesting games I've ever played. Haunting Ground, Rule of Rose, the Silent Hill games, uh, Clock Tower 3, um... The Siren 1 and 2, just, oh my god, fantastic games that did not get the love that I feel that they deserved. Ab absolutely fantastic games. I really wish that we, um, that we could get modern, uh, either remakes or at least ports of these games. They were so freaking good. <sighs> so those are some of the games that I played. There was obviously, oh my god. So... I was never big on fighting games, but one game I played to the, when the almost my buttons fell out of my controller was Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3. I have never even heard of that, but it sounds great. Oh my god. Dragon Ball Z, I think in Japan it's just called Dragon Ball Z 3, and it is such a... F mm. It is... If you're a fan of Dragon Ball, it is the one of the quintessentials like Dragon Ball fighting games. It is so good. It has such an amazing cast. It has a not shallow fighting system. And the, the visual flair, the art style, everything is fantastic. Um, the original version on the PlayStation 2 has a different soundtrack than the HD remake. So if you can get your hands on the original PlayStation 2 version, I would recommend doing that because the music is so much better. I won't get into why the music is different because that's a little bit touchy. But... I highly recommend going for that version. It's it's so much fun. If I can ever, ever organize like an off collab where a ton of people can just sort of face off against each other because it has a tournament mode, because of course it does. It's the, um, the strongest under the heavens uh, martial arts tournament from the manga. And oh my, if I, if I can get a bunch of members of EN to face off in a tournament, oh, I would love that. I would absolutely adore that. That sounds like so much fun. Holy shit. I've never I've never played a Dragon Ball fighting game like Fighter Z. The only fighting games that I've ever been super into were Mortal Kombat 9 and um 
and now Smash Ultimate, obviously. But I mean, mm. I mean, Smash Ultimate is just a game that I play every single day, and then I get like it, it disproportionately angry at, and then leave feeling upset. Um, but <laughs> what's the angriest you've ever gotten while playing a video game? Do you recall? I have a story. So, oh wait, can I can I get a refill for this? Absolutely. Okay, I will be one moment. One moment. I'm, I'm yeah. gonna look you like go I'm for it, and for I will. Second. I will relax. Hang on a minute. Let me let me do the let me do the thing. He's getting his refill. <laughs> How is everybody doing? By the way, I hope you're all enjoying the show. I've been having a lovely, lovely time. It's great to have a chat with my buddy. I love listening to the sounds from his house. Just the. Brr. We can do whatever we want. We should boom, boom. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. Never mind. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I did not expect today to be us nerding out about obscure media, but goodness me, if I haven't been having a great time. <laughs> And I'm glad that so many people are here to listen to us. Listen, this is what's great about this kind of a format because, I mean, you guys are learning a lot, you know, about different art forms. I'd hope a lot of hey, people are doing that kind of thing. Hello, welcome back. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Grabbed a okay, refill on so his tell me this story. All right, it's not exactly hilarious, but this is the angriest that I've gotten in a long time. I can't remember what it was at. Prob yeah, it was Smash. So, uh, Smash gives you a lot of room to express toxicity. There is, uh, obviously there's teabagging. There's the turbo teabag, where you use TAS technology to teabag faster. There's the turbo reverse teabag, where you teabag in both directions. Like, you turn around and around and then teabag in the middle of that. There is the old tech where you turn around rapidly and you sort of walk fast in both directions as well while, while oh, dash walking dancing backward. dash dance there's dash dancing there's also dash there's also walk dancing where you sort of walk back and forth and a lot of characters have pretty sassy walk animations there is the long held <laughs> crouch that ddd can do i can't remember who it was so i was up against a me gunner and you know the A Mies. Me Gunner. You know Mies. They can change their character. And this guy, I won't say who, but they had built their character to represent an extremely offensive and controversial character from history. And I was already like, all right. And they, all of their abilities, you know, because the Mies, they can customize them. All of their abilities were bound to just keep you at range, zone you out. I it wasn't was. was Tokugawa, was it? I wish it was Tokugawa. Uh, it would have been. It would, it would have been. It would have been less offensive. But it was that, and they zoned me out with all of these long-range moves for about as long as they could. And every time they took a stock, they did the turbo tea bag. And I sat there, and not only I was mad at the game. I was mad. Chat knows who I'm talking about. I was mad at the game. I was mad at them because they were being personally offensive to me and all of that kind of stuff. And I'd already had a bad day where I hadn't won many games. And immediately I was just, I was just tensing. Like I was like, I need to win this or I know I'm going to freak out. And then I didn't win. Obviously they three stocked Ooh. me because I just couldn't Ooh. get in. Like when they tilt you to begin with, when they tilt you to begin with, it's so difficult to get yourself off tilt to just play normally. You know, if you get mad, you don't play correctly. You know, and after mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. after it finished, obviously classic Daipan, like really hard. And then I grabbed my controller and I threw it at my screen. But beneath the screen was a little glass, um, like a, a like like a little whiskey glass that one of my roommates had given me as a present, and it had the letter V on it, like my initial. It was a really thoughtful gift, and I missed the screen and it smashed straight into this no. glass and the glass went everywhere no. like all over my desk it flew onto the wall into my face and everything it didn't hurt me but it happened and i saw that and then what hits you 
after the initial rage at the game is the shame. And the shame oh. causes more rage. And then I hit my desk a few more times. And I walked outside, uh, because when I used to live in my, um, in my, in my old house with my roommates, we had uh, basically a landing area where all four of our bedrooms kind of were like really tightly sort of like put together, you know, like there was a little landing and then you had four doors. Each one was one of our bedrooms. And I walked out, one of the roommate who gave me that glass had his door open, was just chilling on his bed. And I looked at him, I said, don't fucking say a word. And I just went downstairs with all the shards of glass and went to go wash my hands and shit. And it was just, oh, that was like, Aww. it was really embarrassing. And then Aww. because essentially when you live with roommates, like especially... Like, my, my roommates were always very sort of um, sensitive. I know one of them was sort of like, yeah, I got bullied when I was a kid. And, like, hearing loud no. noises like that makes me nervous. And so I never knew that for a long time. But all I knew is that whenever I got mad at a game and I would, like, do a daipan, everyone in the house would be passive-aggressive with me for the rest of the day, which would... The knowledge of that would then make me more angry, you know? And then I would, f I would feel, like, A, upset at myself, B, annoyed that the entire thing was going on, and it just got worse and worse and worse over time. It was just a whole disaster. Like, getting mad at games was a whole process back in the day. And then I would have to go down and say, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, like, I didn't mean it, and all that kind of stuff. And it was just, oh, God. Which makes me glad that I live alone now, because now I can, like abuse my desk as much as I like without worrying about making someone sad, which is nice. Mm. What about you? I feel like I, I've sort of grown out of the intense rage that I used to have, which uh, now the most I'll do is like, I'll, I'll curse and that's about it. <laughs> Immediately I hear, I hear a, uh, what is it? The... The soundbite of you falling really far and jump king. Oh yeah, honestly, that that's the, that's one of the strongest f bombs I've dropped in a while. I have. I a, don't even um, know why. Looking back at it, I'm just like, why did I get so mad at this? Listen, it's that prolonged exposure, you know, like the prolonged exposure to the game, and then suddenly just oh, see, for me, right. That sound effect has an extra impact because when you know when, when Hugo was doing that whole prank call thing where he yeah, soundbited, that. <laughs> that was one of the sound bites. And I woke up from my nap. I had been traveling. This is when I still live with my roommates, but I had gotten the keys to my new place, and I had gotten like three hours of sleep in the past forty-eight hours. And I took a nap, like an hour nap, to get ready for my Resident Evil stream. And then I woke up, and Hugo was calling me, and I was like, "Huh." You, I, I don't call with Hugo. What the fuck is going on? And I answered it, and I started hearing your voice, and then you just went fuck, and I was like, ah! like it just scared the hell out of me. I was like, what the hell is going? On? Like I was genuinely, I kind of knew what was going on, but I was so tired that I was still somewhat genuinely confused. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th that was that was a pretty bad one. But one of the worst ones rem that I remember. It didn't, it didn't get violent, but it's one of the angry, one of the most angry moments I've ever had playing a video game. Okay, so I grew up playing a lot of Halo on mm. Xbox Live. And they, that's, no, that's not a great way to start you, a story. You've been, like you've been talking a lot about Halo recently, yeah. Yeah, I want to play Halo so bad. I was actually playing it uh, the other day before we had like a, a specific game meeting. And... Uh, I just, I just had an absolute blast. Halo is so much fun. And uh, when I was playing Halo 3, I was playing team doubles with a friend. And we, we played a lot of team doubles together. It was great. So it's like 2v2 on various maps. And for some reason, we just kept getting matched with people that should not be around the rank that we were. And they were just steamrolling us. And it, they weren't even the kind of people that are exceedingly good go in stomp all over you and then tip their hat and leave no they had to be toxic about it because there, there's voice chat in that game and mm. the worst part is it's proximity based so like when, when they killed you you get to see your body a little bit and they they would drop a tea bag or something and they would say things and it's even worse in halo because you can punch the corpse so they'd like rag dolls around <laughs> making you even more and it doesn't help that the punch sound effects is incredibly cartoonish it just sounds like <laughs> yeah it's and at one point when we were like they were maybe like six or seven kills away from winning i just 
lost it completely like while I was on voice chat with my friend and just like just shouted at the top of my lungs okay yeah see if you can kill me if I do this and I stood up and in rage just unplugged my entire Xbox from the wall <laughs> just didn't press turn off didn't leave the game I just unplugged it entirely <laughs> Straight from the wall. It's so, it's so incredibly unnecessary. That's so extra. I love it. I know. Oh my god. It's like one of those really old YouTube videos of like nerd destroys Xbox. I don't think you destroyed it, but you just fully pulled it out from the wall. That's that's incredible. That because it's such an inconvenient way of raging. Like the best way to get your anger out is to throw your controller because it's a convenient heavy item that's right in your hand. But just grabbing the Xbox and be like, "Fuck you!" Oh, you're a classic, a classic gamer. I love that. It's not the most violent rage I've had though, but it's one of the most memorable. The most <sighs> okay. I don't know if it's violent, but I used to have a Game Boy Color that I had Super Mario Brothers Deluxe on it which is a, you know, a Game Boy Color port of the original Super Mario Brothers with a ton of extras. It's like, it's like the, the actual content in the game is great. Like there's so much content. They even included a version of Super Mario Brothers 2 that never got released in the West because it was considered too difficult in there on that cartridge. It's great. There's just one problem with it. Screen crunch. Hmm because a Game Boy screen is not as big as a TV screen. So that made it exceedingly more difficult to play, where you couldn't see ahead of you enough. It was really, really rough. And when I would play that, I would sit at my desk, and many times where I would just, like, die, I would get frustrated, so I would, like, bang on the desk several times. And there was one point that I recall where I did that, and I could just hear the front door opening, because um, there was another person living with me, and that just thought that somebody was knocking on the door. So they thought <laughs> that somebody was at the door. But the worst thing that happened is I had a bunch of Monopoly pieces because I had I'd been playing Monopoly quite close to when this happened. And there was like the car, like the hat and all that stuff. And one of them was a old fashioned cannon that is like pointing up. And when I died, I got really angry. Didn't look where I was punching so I slant die punt the heck out of my desk right onto that cannon piece and it went into my hand like and impaled you there it impaled me oh my and god it was stuck in there and it didn't quite register to me what was happening so I had to actually yank it out and the actual pipe of the cannon wasn't entirely smooth either it had like you know those rings around it to like sort of decorate it so it like I pulled it out then it got snagged I had to yank it a little bit then it got snagged again and then yank it a last time to get it out and uh, yeah that really hurt and ever since then I stopped punching my desk when I got angry playing that game Jesus I also Christ. hid a hole in my desk once that I got by spiking my Xbox controller. <laughs> I fucking love how that's the term for throwing your your controller at the ground is spiking it like in Smash. Yeah. <laughs> they don't call him Spike Evelyn for no reason. Yeah, I, I luckily it was right in front of my computer, so I could put my I could put my keyboard over it. So uh, nobody could see that it was there was a giant hole in my desk. It didn't help that it was an IKEA desk either. So like it was very very fragile. It would like buckle at the tiniest thing. <laughs> God, chat Ike is like strong. You could put a hole in a desk. Jesus. I put multiple holes. One from my fist. One from my controller. This is different from the one where I impale my hand. By the way, this is a different desk. The man could put a hole in me any day, but I won't talk about that. <laughs> I don't do that anymore now. Like, the, the most I rage... The, the most I've raged at a shooter was Luxium versus Noctix. That was the oh, last time I raged. Oh, yeah. No, me that too. That was the last time I raged at a shooter. Uh, Wait, are you talking about chivalry or are you talking about... Um, no, 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 no. Um, when... Um, in chivalry, I was just confused. Uh, in Valorant, <laughs> I got hit by I, when I got hit by the concussi for the umpth time. 
I just I just lost it, the, the, and I dropped an F-bomb. But when it actually comes to playing off-stream, I don't really rage. Like, I, there's hmm. a, one person that I tend to play Apex a lot with, who I will not mention, and that tends to rage a lot whenever they get killed. And even though I'm playing with them, I always just go, ah, oh, that's too bad. Like, I never really get overly angry or shout at my screen when I die in Apex. Like, it just doesn't happen. You and I are of a different breed. I feel like I rage more when I'm off stream, when I'm off stream, because, like, I don't want... I mean, I guess it differs. I don't know if you saw, but no game is safe from making me angry. I don't know if you saw clips of me playing Mario 64, but for whatever reason, it took me, like, 12 attempts to beat Bowser, like, the final boss, because in the third phase, oh, like, it Bowser gets... Bowser in the sky? Yeah. It gets so oh, difficult to throw him with the star-shaped stage. I was actually getting so fucking angry, like, the entire time, and... Yeah, it just doesn't it it, it it just does it just doesn't end. And I feel like off stream I'm even worse. Like with Smash, I just sort of I just sort of throw the controller on the ground and I'll just sit there and I'll seethe and then sometimes I'll say something. I'll be like, You're a bitch like out loud and I'll be like, I'm gonna get a drink and then I just stand up and go to the fridge, you know. I think the only difference between me when I lose in games off stream is that I don't know, I guess I'm a little bit more unhinged. Hmm. A little bit like, like uh, for example, if I'm playing, like, I know when I played Valorant off stream and I was really, really popping off, there was a lot of, like, uh, <laughs> sit down and stuff like that. Mm. I know I, that it happens sometimes on stream, but, like, not a lot. But, you know, when I when I really feel boastful, when I feel, feel that I did, uh, when I did good, I, I, I can't help it. I can't help it. I, I, don't, I don't do well in shooters very, very often. So when it does happen, I kind of want to indulge in it. No, that's fair. I think being toxic is the... It's sort of a part of shooter culture, isn't it? Like, in, in shooting games, I feel like being toxic is a part of the experience. And every time that you lose and someone is toxic to you, there's also a time where you'll do well. And then you get a chance to be toxic back. And it's just sort of a part of the experience, I guess. You know? Mm. You know one of the worst things? It's that when somebody is talking mad smack and being toxic. And they're like at the bottom of the scoreboard. Just because their team is winning. They're the dead weight. But their team is winning because of somebody else. And they're the ones talking the smack. <laughs> oh, oh my god. It's always the people at the bottom of the scoreboard. It's like, I remember there was a dude... There was a, there was, I remember I was watching a, a, the, the, the video where Donkey plays Valorant and like there was a guy on his team on voice chat who was being really toxic and, and he was he was he was like, yeah, you know, you guys suck. And they were like, you're at the bottom of the scoreboard. It's like, all right, let me start trying. And he, in that nanosecond, gets shot. Like he immediately gets just gets just one tap immediately. And he's like, all right, <laughs> fine. <laughs> anyway, oh, Lordy, um, Lordy. I have a question. What's up? How hungry are you right now? I could go for some sustenance. I have an idea. Every I'm time, listening. every time you and I collab, we we have an, a long series of collabs. I've definitely collabed with you more than I have with any other member of Niji En. Is and it is that really so? Because you you collab quite a bit. I, I do collab quite a bit, but I think owing to horror husbandos or homies, as you would have it, I think <laughs> that we we've collabed quite a lot. And every time that we do that, we play a horror RPG together. You have a Borg. I do and I'm wondering Borg, if to awesome. commemorate so many collabs and this moment where we've got our own pretty successful collab going, why don't we both order a Borg right now? Ordering a Borg sounds pretty freaking good right now. Let's get some Borg. Let's get us some Borgs. I'm going to get a Borg as well because, you know, this alcohol is great, but it needs something savory to go with it. You're so right. You're so right. The uh, horror has bandos more like the Borg brothers. Am I right? The Chet? Borg brothers. The I like Borg that. brothers. Um, oh. Mm. Um. Uh, the instant. Oh I my opened, god! I need to look up I what this open, word is in English. I open Deliveroo, and the instant I look at a burger, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So what the heck is this called in English? Do they call it Chuck in English? What? There's no way. What? There's okay. So 
there's this like kind of burger that I usually get uh, with uh, in Swedish. It's called högrev, where it and I don't. It's like this uh, finer type of meat, sort of, for lack of a better term. It's like nicer. It's like more fancy, and it just tastes so much better. But I don't know what it's called in English. And I Google it, and they just say that it's called chuck. Does it have a description of what the chuck contains? Uh, let me let me have a look. See. Uh, high reef. I don't think that's accurate. <laughs> I, I don't know what the fuck that is. Uh, it's a part of the cow, apparently. Let me copy it and send it to you. Uh, oh, love of God. Here, I'll, I'll send you a Wikipedia article. Let me have a look. Oh, the chuck. Right, I, I I missed what you were talking about. But yeah, the chuck steak from like the front of it. A chuck yeah, yeah, is yeah. generally um a pretty cheap steak. Uh, from what I know, the chuck is a um it's sort of a term at least in uh, no sorry I'm getting it mixed up. A, in if you go to a butcher, a pluck is the is a term for if you want the lungs, the esophagus, the throat, the heart, and all of the, like the bits of meat from an animal that you wouldn't normally eat. Because apparently, I haven't tried them, but apparently lung is really tasty. It's got a very spongy mm. texture. So I've heard. But yeah, I tend to get like burgers that like has like a lot of chuck in them. And it's, in my opinion, way more delicious than your average just like uh, beef burger. Oof. So if you've never had it, I highly, highly recommend it. I'm just looking at the burgers from this restaurant and I'm actually I'm actually going to have a panic attack. Oh my god, these look so oh good. Oh no, is it too much good stuff? It's so greasy. Oh, oh no. I need the grease right now. You need the grease. I need the grease. Oh. You want to know something funny? Grease actually means pig in Swedish. <laughs> I couldn't have imagined more fitting. The whoever whoever it was that figured out that wrote the Swedish language based <laughs> Based on, uh, it's based on German, so there you go. Thank, uh, thank the Germans. Thank you, Germany. Thank you, Germany, for the Swedish language. I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the Japanese countryside. Like, ha I haven't been to Sweden, but I've been to a lot, a lot of Scandinavia, and the landscapes there are second to none. You know. Like oh my the, God, Norway! Holy crap! I, I Norway. Went I went on a That's such beautiful nature. I went on a cruise through Norway um, a few years ago. I went um, through the fjords, and it has to be Ooh. seen to be believed. The most frustrating part of that trip, trying to take pictures of the mountains, and a phone camera just doesn't capture the it scale of what you're justice. looking at. You need to go there yourself. Like you really, really need to go there yourself to see what it's like. You really gotta. You Norway really gotta. is something else. I remember there was a place where it was. Um, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called like Elden or something. Like um, that's, that sounds very Scandinavian. Uh, it's like Al, uh, like like Alder or something, or like something like that. But it's a, a very, very small Norwegian town. But our cruise ship docked there, and it's a super small town, like right in the center of um, like there's a little sort of like a dagger shape bit of ocean that goes into it, and then. Mm. Right from there, there's a tiny village, and then beyond it, a path. And you go on the on the path, and there's a glacier. And I looked at the picture of the glacier online, and I was like, that's just a piece of melting ice in a mountain. And you go there in person, and it's like, whoa. Yeah. You know, it's fucking gigantic. It's something you need to see to believe, you know. that's a, There's a lot of things that photos just don't do justice. One of those things, the northern lights. Oh. Holy crap. Like, anything that you've seen in, in, in pictures... Not even close. Like it, when you see it, it looks unreal. You feel like you stepped into a movie and you're watching CGI in front of your eyes. I've been to Iceland, and I went on one of those trips, like one of those jeep rides where they take you into the the wilderness to look at the Northern Lights, and the Northern Lights they just weren't out at that time oh. of day. And we went out all that time. Like my ass hurt from traveling that long, and <laughs> they just weren't there. <laughs> Oh, that sucks. Give me one moment. Um, I need to have my phone on standby for when the delivery comes. I will be right back. Go and grab it, King. Oh, my God. It's Ipsy. 
<laughs> My man is tipsy. Let's go. I clearly need to drink more. I was trying to try and decide what to get. I'm getting like a mac and cheese burger. I don't know. I don't know if I like mac and cheese though. It does look crispy fried. Okay, I'll, I'm just gonna get this and give it a try. It looks nice. All right, uh, and then I'm gonna get some fries or something on the side. Oh fuck, I'm hungry, man. Why is it that whenever you can't find your phone anywhere, the bathroom is always a good first bet? Me, I fucking agree with you. Like, every time I go to the bathroom, if I'm going to take a dump, I need my phone. Because, mm. like, like every time I'm like, all right, guys, i got to take a shit, I need my phone. Because I know I'm going to be sat there for a little bit, and I need to, like, look at my phone. And then every time when I go to, like, wipe... I leave my phone on like a corner somewhere. Like for me, my bathtub is right next to the the basin and the bathtub has a sort of a side that's wide enough to hold my phone. So I just stick it there, go and wash my hands and I always fucking forget it. And so every time I'm like, where is my phone? I'm like, oh yeah, it's on the corner of the bath because I sat it there while I, while I, was, taking, while I, was, I was dropping the kids off at the pool, you know. <laughs> Don't say that. It's fun. Come on. That's that's a good term for it. I like it. Oh my god. That's mm. <laughs> But yeah, I I I totally get what you mean. For me, usually the main reason I lose my phone sometimes and find it in the bathroom is because I Whenever I take a shower, I, I bring my Bluetooth speaker and I put on one of my playlists. And Me I listen, too! And I listen to, like, music while taking a shower because otherwise I'm like, it's so quiet, it's boring here. It's definitely, like, we awkward in the shower, even though, like, you're alone. You know, it feels like, God, I need some volume in here, you know, and I always... My favorite tune for a shower, I don't know if you've heard it, what is it? Um, Lemon Tree by... Uh, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lemon Tree by Fool's Garden. I always put the da 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 da. I just do that while I'm like washing my pits mm. in the pool of sacred tears. <laughs> One of the things um, that I re recall seeing on Twitter a while ago that made me laugh so hard, not because I relate it, but, but, but because like it's just sort of, yeah, I can see that with a lot of people. Because you, you know how singing in the shower is sort of like um, a stereotype? Mm -hmm. I don't really do that because mainly because I have neighbors and I, I I bother them with being loud enough as it is. But I remember somebody saying, "You oh you you don't need to take thirty minutes in, in the shower. You're wasting a lot of water. You can like, get everything that you need to get done in like eight to ten minutes." And then somebody quote retweeted it and just said, "But what about my fans?" <laughs> <laughs> because they. <laughs> They're like imagining themselves as a pop star while in the shower. <laughs> I think showering is some of the most valuable alone time that a person can have. No matter what your living situation is, no one. Like, I mean, maybe I've, I've met some people who like if they shower for longer than 10 minutes, like their parents or their family will be like, get out of the shower, which is, first of all, a violation of your human rights. But, <laughs> but like... I, my shower's 30 minutes minimum. I just stand there and I think. I just stand there, I wash slowly, I relax. Sometimes I sit down, I just kind of like, I, I just kind of like get some shower water in my mouth. I'm like, you know, like it's just <laughs> something. I'm so glad I'm not the only one that does that. Yes, like shower water has a unique taste. You know, you've got to okay, like, I, like. I never oh, swallow oh, it. I always do just like, like uh, gargle it and then spit it and spit it because ugh, I don't want to swallow. Oh that. yeah, not good to, uh, not good to swallow. But still, like interesting, just like, oh, and just to kind of stand there. Maybe you sing. Maybe you just think about the day. You know, shower, showering is the place to reflect. And uh, I don't sometimes know. for better or for worse. Do you do you have a bathtub? I don't. It makes me very, very sad. See, which is why I'm so mm. happy whenever I'm traveling and I get a hotel that has shower and the ba uh, bathtub like combined together. I'm just like, I'm gonna take a freaking bath. There's something so therapeutic about ba about bathing that I sort of forgot about for a while. Because when I was living with my roommates, I we didn't have a bath. But now that I've moved, I do. And the amount of times that like maybe I've sort of I remember I think it was after I had my, my the, the pilot episode of this show with Shoto I was still drunk and I thought oh god I need to kill some time I went and I had a bath and I 
grabbed a plate with some cooked meat, like some turkey and some ham, and a little bit of like sriracha ketchup. I made like a little charcuterie board almost, and I just put that on one of my bedside tables. I pulled it into the bathroom, and I had a bath, and I sat there, and I popped over my phone, and I watched like some random ass like trash content, like a oh tier list of Ooh. favorite World of Warcraft zones. While I had oh like God. ketchup, while I had sriracha ketchup with ham while taking a bath, and I have never felt more relaxed in my life. I think that would, might have been one of the greatest moments I've had. That sounds divine. One of the most relaxing baths I have ever had is during a winter when it was like easily negative 27 or something. It was cold as heck. And I made the grave mistake of uh, not bringing any gloves. So I had to walk home with uh, in nothing but jeans, a jacket and a hat like mm. to cover my ears and head. Nothing like, like those jeans were like not doing me any favors. And Yet. there was only... There was only so much that I could do by pulling my hands into the sleeves. It was pretty bad. I was very cold. And I got back home and I filled myself up a warm bath and I turned off the lights. I got a bunch of like uh, candles and set them all around the four corners of the bathtub. I made myself two like two sandwiches and a cup of hot chocolate. And I said like I just simmered in the bathtub, had like the sandwich, drank the hot cocoa. And I was in bliss. It was, mmm. It was wonderful. It's the the most relaxing bath I've ever had. I'm, it's wow. one of the reasons I still miss bathtubs is because moments like that. I just want to spoil myself sometimes because I can't do that anymore. And there's nobody else around to spoil me. Not in this tiny apartment. I mean, there's never been a better time. You know, it's, it's a pretty crazy experience, you know, like um, for both of us having, you know, kind of like scored that audition in Niji Sanji and like getting to, getting get, getting all of the success so quickly. Like for me, you know, that was the excuse for me to move somewhere new that I'd always wanted to live. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it out here. I'm wondering, are you content where you are? Are you planning on maybe checking like somewhere else? I like where I am. Hmm. I like where I am. It's, the thing with me is I don't need a lot. I don't ask for a lot. Honestly, some people hate like cramped spaces i find cramped spaces cozy they sort of remind me of a secret base mm. or everything so small apartments you just feel like you know th 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 this is my little secret base like i can turn this into whatever whatever the heck i want i can make this into like my, my little my little music space my little gaming space or whatever the heck that's really cute. I like it. I like it a lot. I'm completely content with I where, where I am right now. That's really cute. I um like I kind of agree with you because like the apartment that I moved into is like pretty spacious, you know. I've got like a nice big living room with lots of space to do stuff. When I'm in there, it's like god, turning this into something of my own, it feels like it'd be a lot harder. You know, when the room mm. is bigger, you have more space to fill. And making it your own space is a lot harder. But when somewhere is like nice and tiny and, you know, there's not much wall space, one thing added to that wall has a lot of personality to it. And it reminds me I had um, the one of the projects that the Kindred worked on for when I hit a million. It was this cookbook and the cookbook had some artwork. And one of the artworks was me like just in a really tiny apartment kitchen, just like frying some eggs. And I was like, damn, that looks Ooh. super cozy. You know, really cozy. One of the most cute things I've ever seen was with like two, um, it, it was like, I think it was fan art from a show that I was watching. So it was like a little bit shippy, but it was a ship that I supported, so I didn't mind. And it, it was just like this um, apartment. You know, those kitchens that has like, it has the sink, the, like uh, the, um, the, the kitchen counter and the washing machine, but then it has an additional like counter in the middle of everything you, you know what i'm talking about right mm -hmm. like 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 a like a like a uh, breakfast bar yeah yeah and it had all the like pans on there and they were sort of like both like preparing like a meal for each other and both leaning over the desk looking lovingly at each other i'm just like oh that's sweet oh, i want that that's wonderful <laughs> I heard what you said a while ago. What was it? I love love. I love love too. 
Yeah, that's the thing with me. I love seeing love in shows. I, it makes me feel so warm and fuzzy, and I'm loving it in the moment. But then when the episode ends, I'm just like sitting there and just like, Universe, when the heck is it my turn? When's it my turn? <laughs> <laughs> Look at us! Look at us! A bunch, a, bu a bunch of maidenless VTubers sat just, just crying over a drink. Like, I think that's the experience that I've had ever since I moved to the big city. You will see love on every corner. Like, you turn a street and there's some couple, like holding hands or making out on a bench, and you can't take the train without looking opposite you and seeing like some two super attractive people just like in each other's arms. And I'm like. When the fuck is it my turn? Yeah, it's just... It's like that. I, I mentioned this TikTok three times now. Like This is going to be the third time where it's... Uh, there was these uh, this guy uh, and a girl. Very conventionally attractive. Not my type per se. But very conventionally attractive by societal standards. Like lining up and uh, posing. And then it just cuts to a manga frame. Really, really atmospheric. With like a guy and a girl who look very similar. And like fitting the same. And then it just cuts to this guy very clearly in the bathroom sitting on the toilet and just like i hate y'all i wish nothing but the worst for you i'm happy for y'all i'm glad that you're happy but that should be me it should be when it's my turn f y'all f y'all i hate this i've talked about this like three times right now and i just think that it's so funny because on one hand yeah it is really cute i'm happy for them but on the other time on the other hand i want to do that too man <laughs> come on yeah, it's just oh uh, it's it's difficult more now than it's ever been, I guess, because when you're in a position like we are, you know, sort of like public figure, you know, you have like um, a lot of responsibilities and especially like how hard we, we, we both work, you know, it's it's really difficult to think about something like dating and, you know, sort of focusing on your personal life and maybe even scoring a maiden every now and again, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's really challenging because every night every day when i stream i'm like man i love this and then i go to bed at night and i'm like man what if the other half of this bed was like weighed down by another person i'm like damn that would be amazing oh god no you're of... gonna make me cry exactly That's not, uh... I, and i just think oh man all right well like good night and then i just sort of go to bed you know and that's and that's that it's it's yeah it's but tough I, um... Uh, for like with me it's just like i love what i'm doing right now i've mm. always loved creating in any way shape or form be it like penning a new novel penning a new story writing a new piece of music or now just like live streaming a brand new experience that i get to share with everybody i love this i wouldn't trade it for anything in the world and i don't want to stop anytime soon but we're still human and sometimes when you go to bed at night and you see that other pillow next to you being empty and uh, not necessarily a maiden, because for me, like, it, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you're just like, man, if somebody was just like, if I wasn't so alone here, and <laughs> it would be kind of nice, you know? Yeah, it's, I guess it's more, I guess it's like, um, you know, more difficult now than ever. Because, like, you know, having expectations on you and also... Having, like, I think especially the, the role that we're given as, like, male VTubers, I think that we're positioned and marketed as people who are, like, our fans are sort of, we're, we're designed to be attractive, you know, and we're designed to be, to be loved by people. And so talking about <laughs> our own lives and our own, you know, prospects in relationships, it can feel pretty bizarre sometimes to sort of think mm. about ourselves in separation from our fans at points, you know? Mm. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. It's just something that I, I feel like the more that I concern myself with thinking about it, the more it's gonna, like, get to me. So, I, I'm very much a living in the present kind of guy, which is mm. probably why I procrastinate a lot, because I'm I focus on what's important right now, and what's important right now is putting on a good show, putting on a good stream and making sure that everybody that decided to take the time out of their uh, take their valuable time out of their days to spend it on watching somebody like me or anybody else get their not, not really their money's worth but get their time's worth hmm. that's the, what's the most important to me uh, currently in my life that's pretty bold and i and i admire that i think um mm. it's a difficult balance to find you know and i think Barring, like, even outside of the whole dating sphere, just finding a balance of work and real life becomes harder and harder when you become a content creator because, like, I mean, think about it. 
for you and I, there really is no taking a 100% vacation because while you're on vacation, you're tweeting, you're thinking about your growth, your numbers, you're thinking about this and that. And so like a proper 100% vacation where you believe that everything else is in the hands of other people and we don't really get that. And so it sort of feels like you're working, even if you're not streaming, you are working 24 seven and it's exhausting at times, you know? Mm, for, for me, it's just sort of that when I took my time off, it's even though I knew that you need this, you've been working uh, really hard, you've uh, you, you've hit some like uh, a couple of roadblocks, it's getting a little bit tough. Even when I was like on that break, I just thought to myself, I miss streaming. Hmm. I feel like I should be streaming right now. I miss talking to chat. I miss the Quildren. I miss being interactive with everybody. I missed a crab game collab, and I was like, man, I should really be there, shouldn't I? I I agree with you, like, 200%. And there's, and I think recently I had an experience where, like, it felt like there was something going on IRL or, you know, management-related that kept me from streaming for a long time. And every week, week after week, I would only be able to do, like, three or four streams a week, and it just didn't feel right. You know, every day I'd wake up, be like, all right, time to stream. And then when you get to that point it just doesn't really you know it, it it feels weird to be without it you know and i'm glad that i'm like past that and i get to stream every day but there's also something we have to consider for ourselves you know streaming every single day is ama is an amazing experience but there's also an aspect to our own personality where you know having a connection to the real world is really important too also my food is here so i'm gonna go <gasps> you are he's gonna welcome. get foomed bah, 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 he's bah, 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 gonna get foomed you are welcome to just chat and keep my chat entertained and i'll be back in just a moment you have fun okay hi kindred how you doing i don't f I feel like we don't get a lot of chances to talk how are you all doing I don't. I, I know that Milord and the Quildren. I don't know how much overlap there is, but hi. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you for being so kind to me when I'm being here right now. I see that so many of you know my little nickname, Ikey Ikey. Oh, oh! I hear distant box noises. Hmm. Drink water, Ike. I will drink water. I will drink water. Do not worry. I am. I'm the CEO of drinking water. Don't you, don't you guys worry. So somebody mentioning Eki. No such person exists. No such person exists. It's amazing what you guys can start believing just because I have a red scarf on hand. Hmm. Mm. Oh. <clears throat> oh god, that was really, that was really strong. You know, one thing that sucks about this like mixture that I'm doing with Sprite and Sours, because I don't mix it, a lot of the blah, 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 Sours is like sinking to the bottom of the glass, so when I get to the bottom of it, I'm drinking almost nothing but pure Sours, which is Kind of like drinking lemonade extract, which you're meant to mix with water, and it's, it's just not pleasant. <laughs> my face feels funny. It's like part of my face is a little bit numb. I don't really feel it. <laughs> ah. A fulgur hoo chan Hi! Did you add blue crackle? I don't know what that is! What is that? I probably didn't. It's just Sprite, Sours, and Ice. Ice! Sorry. Mmm. This is so sour. I know it's called sours, but damn. Why is it so sour? I stop being too cute. You stop being too cute. Why do I get... Think about yourself and your own actions. 
You guys are being cute. Making my cheeks hurt with how much you're making me smile. Take some responsibility. Hmm. Man, fans of Niji, Sanji are so adorable. That's the thing with me. I never really understood the whole Hollywood concept of beauty. I think it's kind of skewed and, and unrealistic. I don't never really look at anybody and think that this person is hot. This person is attractive. I don't get that. If I can find somebody cute, then that can lead to other things. A person's got to be cute first. And the thing, Niji Sanji fans, you guys are so cute. Oh my god, you guys are so adorable. <laughs> Don't hit me with the no you, that's cheating. That's not fair. Blah. <laughs> Uno reverse card. I haven't played Uno in a while. Uno is the kind of game that would be fun when you're drunk. That would be fun. Oh no, I feel like a burp's coming on. No, I don't have OBS open. I don't mute with OBS. I mute with this. Eh. <laughs> Mm. Chat is going absolutely nuts. What did you tell them? I said they were cute. I agree. Oh, that sounds amazing. Yo, did anybody see Oliver Senpai's 3D debut? Yeah! We're gonna yeah! stream, baby! Let's go, Sensei! It's 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 such a weirdo experience, at least for me. You know, like the whole the whole thing of like Working in this organization for such a long time and then being like gifted like you may now You may now graduate you may now grow and become 3d and it's like oh <gasps> Don't say graduate. Oh, shit. You're I didn't fool. mean it. I didn't mean it. You're fool. Oh My god, this is a fucking huge burger. Jesus Christ Ah Mm. Yeah, Oliver Senpai did absolutely amazing. I loved seeing Eden Gumi. I loved seeing other members of EN. It was fun to see us there. I remember when we when we did that with Sensei. It was absolutely wonderful. It was great. Oh. Mm. Oh my God! I am Kev. You're toasting a rock star. Woo! Let's go! Let's go! I figured, you know, now that I've got my food, might as well have a seat. There's a load of crispy onions on this burger. This is actually, this is really good. Oh my god. Hey, that's a lot of strawberries. Why didn't I get those? We can have some strawberries. Want some strawberries? I like strawberries. They're my thing. Do you want, a oh. Do you want some strawberries? Um. Hmm. All right. I mean, you can, ha you, you can have that. I'll just leave Thank that on your you. side and you can pass it back if you're feeling generous. Thank you. You're welcome. I love strawberries. Oh my gosh. I remember once when I was in New York City, mm -hmm. I stopped by a pastry shop. They had a massive strawberries. It was as big as like, like four fingers put together. And it was like, it had been dipped in strawberry and it had like a brighter chocolate, like sort of swirly around it, making a spiral pattern. And I ate it and it was delicious. It was mm. divine. This might be one of the best burgers I've ever eaten, but it is falling apart. Oh, yeah. The, the thing with, like, oh my god, certain food when you're, like, like a little bit inebriated is, like, so amazing. Mm. I remember recently when uh, it was when I made the funky fun gun tweet when I was very, very drunk, and I got McDonald's. Mm. And I have never had McDonald's that tasted more divine in my entire life. Mm. One moment. Oh. Oh, he's chomping. Um. Um. <coughs> oh. Oh. I have something to say about this. Oh. Mmm. 
McDonald's is the best drunk food, 100%. 100%. Oh my god. McDonald's, the, the, the thing is like people... Uh, oh, speaking of food, that that is my cue. Ike's is Hold here, on. good timing. Off he goes. Bup, 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 to grab his food. Yeah. I'll tell him the story when he gets back, but chat, listen. If you need food while you're absolutely off your shit, the best is- is- it's just McDonald's. I am correct. And I won't be argued with. God damn, this burger is- is in ruins. It's falling apart at the seams. So guys, what was Ike talking about? Because <laughs> you lot, you lot were going nuts. You lot were going nuts over what he was saying. He never had a Denny's while blasted, but McDonald's is good. Shut the fuck, McDonald's is good enough. Called you cute. Ooh. I wish I'd have been there. I could have counted myself as a part of you guys. I wish he would call me cute. Hmm. Hmm. God damn, this is good. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, I know he's cute. He is very cute, isn't he? And I've really enjoyed this chat, just getting to talk about art and culture and film and all that, like... When I say this guy is based, I'm not just saying that. He's based. This guy knows his shit. And I feel so blessed. So blessed. To be someone that gets to talk to him personally. Honestly. It is insane. Yo, I got my food! My man! Tell me about the burger you got. Oh my god, I paid a little bit extra for some extra bacon. Mm. Let's see if they, if they deliver. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, they delivered! Oh, mmm. Mm. Mmm. Oh, it's so good. Mm. Me too, brother. Me too. Mmm. Oh, that's divine. So what I got mm. is a mac and Warren, cheese Wasn't burger. there a hashtag or something we were gonna do? Yeah, we'll do that now. Uh, there are a lot of really good questions there. Mmm. We wound up just chatting for like literally two hours about f about just whatever, which is amazing. But I guess you'd expect Time it. Time flies when you're having fun. I guess I should expect it when I'm here with um, someone that I know as well as I know you. Mmm. 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 You ever watched Shmo Yoho back in the day? Accent on the O. The cheese up in here is going ham. Damn, 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 damn. damn. Cross pretty crunch. Damn. damn. Look at the bacon. Damn. damn. Just do this. Damn, damn, damn. 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 Oh, it's Get so a good. grocery bag. I'm going absolutely bananas over this burger. This mac and cheese burger. Holy shit, that was good. Mmm. Mac and cheese? Really? A burger with that? I mean, give it a try if you want to test it. This shit was fucking baller. Jesus I'm Christ. Ugh. I was like, yeah, instead of the cheese layer, there's just a 
thick, like gooey layer of mac and cheese over the top, and there was bacon, and there was like two patties. There was a beef patty and a chicken patty at the same time, and they were both one on top of each other, and there's like this tomato Ooh. sauce. Oh, I'm a fat boy. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. He's a fat boy, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> oh, nice. Tuscadu. Oh my god, the fat boy emojis. <laughs> Let's go. That might be one of my favorite emojis, especially because when you look at it in why YouTube. Why are you so quiet all of a sudden? Hmm? I don't know why, but you're so quiet. I'm quiet? Suddenly. What do you mean? On, on, on Discord, at least. It's so really? weird. Really? It's odd. I mean, you can always turn me up. No, it's okay. Yeah, I'll turn you up to 200. Say the same thing. Huh? Eh, that's acceptable. That's bizarre. Chat, am I quiet? I think it might be a, like a Discord thing because Discord has been like turning people down a lot. Discord lately. has been being really weird lately. Like even with um, like the Kung Fu Panda watch along we were doing with the uh, with mm, Raymond recently. Like the, yeah. the the bug with noise reduction. Yeah. Like if it, noise reduction is a lifesaver, especially for me that needs my AC on. But when you join a screen share and have noise reduction on, you become quiet. But if you turn it off, you become audible. It's very weird. Um. But yeah, I always find like the whole Discord audio detection to be a little weird because sometimes it doesn't pick up my sound effects and it makes me sad. Like sometimes mm. I want to do a brap, you know, like a, like I just want to send that out. <laughs> I just want to send that out. But sometimes it, Discord just doesn't pick it up. It's so quintessentially you. <laughs> like when you're in Discord with me, you're chatting with me, you're getting to know me as a person. You want to know me. You get to know the real me, and the real me is gassy. You guys don't gassy understand, like, e even, even during, like, tech checks for, like, conventions, Vox will not ha hold off on his soundboard. Like, uh, for those of you who don't know, Vloxium are gonna be guests at um, Anime Impulse yeah, very, baby. very soon. And we, we have had our little, like, check-ins with, like, the wonderful staff at Anime Impulse, and that has not stopped Vox from pressing the brap sound effects. I was doing that in front of all of this professional like tech staff. It was great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They just gotta get used to they just gotta get used to me. You know, they gotta they, if they invite me, they invite all of me. <laughs> including including that Megas. Listen. Facts are not rude, they are a fact of life. Mm. Alright. I think now. We're literally almost two hours in, which is crazy, but I'm figuring mm. now might be a good time to ask some questions from the hashtag. Mm. So I've got a really good one here, and I think you and I have already talked about this, but it might be good to mention this uh, in front of everybody. If you, this is a question from Carrot RGB on Twitter. If you were to watch along, do a collab watch along, which films would you pick? I think we already have this settled, don't we? I think we do. It would be the lighthouse and martyrs. Mm -hmm. Lighthouse on on my end and martyrs on yours. Because have you seen the lighthouse yet? I have not. It's insane. I you haven't. Watch I know it. you'll love like it. We, we, because we talked about the thing, and I wanted to commit to that. I didn't want to watch it without you. Mm -hmm. I am very keen on doing this with you at some point. Like we do lighthouse on my channel and martyrs on your channel. Like we sort of swap over and all that kind mm. of stuff and make sure that it's like a double billing and both of us are sat there experiencing because you've never seen lighthouse. I've never seen martyrs before. And I, I understand from what I understand, martyrs seems like a really difficult film to watch, but like difficult oh, to watch. It is tough. It is tough to get through. You Dif need a stomach for it. Difficult to watch is my favorite thing. I mean, I loved, I mean, I understand Midsommar probably isn't as bad, but I loved Midsommar. Oh, not even nearly. Mm, but but I the thing with Midsommar, Midsommar is like a lot of it is just like the impending dread. And Midsommar has like, it's atmosphere, like permanent atmosphere, mm. you know, it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, there's Just... so many movies that like have a lot of violence and gore for shock value, but because you can tell that it, it doesn't really mean anything, it's just there for the sake of shocking people, that sort of takes a lot of the, a lot of the oomph out of it. With Martyrs, it's just like, it's not for shock value, like it's, it all serves a purpose. And I believe it's sort of inspired by this one m movement within French cinema called French extremism mm. or some something along those lines. 
where there are a lot of really really violent movies uh, got made for the but it's it's still like done in a sort of artful way if that makes sense because when i watch martyr that i've watched movies that has intense graphic violence and i'm just like okay you're just trying too hard right now i don't get that with martyrs with mm. martyrs i'm just like oh dear god what is happening oh good lord oh my i it's the immersion you get into it like you you're trying to figure out what the heck is going on oh my god what is happening to these characters like is this even like did they even do they even have the right idea or did like comp- innocent people just like suffer at the hands of the these people that are not all there it's a it's really really like it's it's an awful concept but it's and terrifying but it's interesting and executed so well martyrs is fantastic there's an american remake though and we don't talk about that one i've heard about that one what is it the spike lee remake is it spike lee no you're thinking of an old boy that one is uh, also that was also also awful. Yes, uh, <laughs> I guess we both have like a favorite movie, like a favorite foreign film that is then remade by Americans and made infinitely worse. But I mean, yeah, Old Boy. Would, I mean, I guess it's kind of sort of looping back to the conversation we had about like remakes and special editions of stuff. Is that the I'm fine with any remake of a film or remaster with new scenes as long as the original is left intact. And that's the thing about Old Boy mm. is that the remake is dog water, but the original is always there and always but available. But the problem is sometimes the remake is marketed not as a remake or an adaptation. It's like marketed as its own thing, like a brand new thing. I will never not be pissed about the fact that the American remake of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo based on a movie, a Swedish movie, and a Swedish novel is viewed on the same playing field as the original. Mm. I don't care if it, was, if it was directed by David Fincher. I don't care if it's starring Daniel Craig. It is not better or on a par with the original. I, it's not. It's, it's just not. It is a different work of art and should be treated as such. Certainly. Mm. I guess that's the thing about remakes is that they'll always be sort of... They will always exist in the shadow of the original. And that's sort of what I feel about a lot of Disney remakes. You know, Aladdin, Lion King, Mulan, whatever it is. I feel as though their existence is to purely provoke nostalgia rather than to be something of themselves and i think that that's a shame you know there's there is value in remaking something and i think some remakes um we know better than the originals like um like oceans 11 you know like oceans mm. 11 was a very old movie that was remade the by george thing. clooney and the thing exactly john carpenter is the thing like you know what a what a classic! You know there are so many mm-hmm. films that are re- that where we know the remake better than we know the original. I mean, obviously everyone in chat is mad at the Lion King remake. I am still mad at the Lion King remake. It just I will never. I feel like I have less of a problem with remakes like that are happening within the same part of the part of the world. I have more of a problem with like like remakes of foreign films mm. simply because nobody wants to read subtitles yeah. foreign cinema is valid there are amazing movies being made all over the world and a lot of people are missing it because people are just like nobody wants to read subtitles we'll just remake it with american actors no no let people experience cultures let people experience the world Allow me to quote a legendary director, the first director to create a film that received Best Picture for at the the Oscars for not being. Is it my boy Bong Joon Ho? Bong Joon Ho, Bong 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 Bong. If you, as he said, if you get over the inch tall barrier of subtitles, you will unlock a world of content that you could have never imagined, and he is absolutely right don't also don't settle for dubs because in my mind i think that we should always watch films as they are intended to be created like for me like the squid game dub i mean come on i 
can excuse dubs with for like in certain instances. There are people with learning disabilities like dyslexia true. True. and with various things that are struggling with reading subtitles. And if your choice, like if your only way of experiencing a property is through dubs, 100% valid. Mm -hmm. If anybody tries to make you feel like less Ford, they're a jerk. Ignore them. Mm -hmm. If you gotta watch dubs because reading subtitles is too difficult, 100% valid. Couldn't agree more. But for those of us who, if you have the ability to read subtitles, you got no excuse. There is a world of better content about there, out there that you can experience, and it's great. And there is so mm. much more that you can see. And it just... I don't know. It always makes me sad. I mean, I like Marvel movies as much as the next guy, but I think that we in the West have had our film palette diluted, I suppose, mm. by, you know, very samey films where some people will, 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 will tell you that the Marvel formula is just the same film being made umpteen different times, like four to five different times a year. And yet, while some of them are different and some of them are, and they're always fun to watch, there mm. is so much more out there. And whether it comes from your your home country, whether it comes from a foreign place where you might need to read subtitles or find a dub of it, you're going to be really surprised when you watch it at how much other cultures have to offer. I mean, that was what I found when I became interested in Korean cinema, you know. And I think one of the most interesting parts of foreign cinema is how culture creates interesting um, differences in how we tell stories. Like, one of the big failings, I think, in the Old Boy remake is the fact that in uh, the original... It loses purpose. American cinema has this obsession with the main character being absolutely morally perfect. And that was never the point of Old Boy. The original Old Boy was about a character completely consumed, devoured by revenge. And that was good. We still rooted for him, even though he was a very damaged and imperfect human being. Whereas in the American remake, the main character, his only motivation is, I want to protect my daughter. And so American viewers can say, oh, I have a daughter. I feel th this way too. And then you lose the nuance and you lose some of the poetry in telling a story about someone who has flaws and is consumed by revenge. You know, it's, it's a real feeling that we need to talk about. And the American remake sort of dilutes that and makes it less powerful. And that's a problem. I mean, not only is the American remake a bad film, but it forgets what made the original so powerful, you know. The original um, uh, Old Boy also has one of the, the single most, like, there's a scene that without giving anything away, um, the, has one of the single most powerful performances I've ever seen put to film, which is going through so so many emotions in the span of just like three minutes of like rage, bargaining, begging, sadness, panic. And it's just such an amazing display of like pure acting prowess by uh, Choi, uh, I think it- Choi Min Sik, is, yeah. Uh, Choi Min Sik. And he just absolutely, it's just, it can't be topped. And like I like Josh Brolin, but I'm like, I I feel bad for Josh Brolin because he has to, not only like, he ha no matter what he does, in the old boy remake, he's going to be compared to Choi Min Sik, mm -hmm. and it it is tough, if not impossible, act to follow. There's there's no following up, and I almost feel like it's a shame to create a remake that lives in the shadow of something that I would say didn't need one. Old Boy is a completed work of art that doesn't need to be reinterpreted. It, I mean, obviously, if you have something else to say with it, that's fine. But I feel as though the American version of the film just doesn't try to tell anything else. It just tries to sort of water it down it, it, from a it different It sort audience. of took the Taken route with me, with what it wants to make the character as cool as possible. That's not what Old Boy was about. Like, Odesu has a little bit of coolness to him. Like, there's the corridor I mean, fight scene yeah, where but he... It, it but it's never the like focus. It's not insistent on mm -hmm. it. It doesn't insist on the fact that the main character, 
uh, of Odesu being cool. It's just something that happens. Like, they, they try to play up the whole body transformation, how he can now, like, kick some ass after, like, being locked up for so long. It just the fact that the, the American version just sort of insists on that, where it is in the original, it's just like Odesu just sort of becomes this person because you see him like transform into this and everything and like through the immense like isolation and everything it's it's fantastic sorry i'm gonna go get a refill i'll be right back you go for it my man you go for it chat level with me is there anything more attractive than when a man rants about his interests oh listen there's nothing more attractive than Ike Eveland. There's nothing more attractive about Ike Eveland than how based he is. His interests, his opinions on film, art, culture, everything. There's something truly different about him and his opinions, and I am loving listening to and agreeing with what he says. I am stunned. Truly, truly stunned by what he's saying. Nah, 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 like after, after you, after, after I left and he was chatting to you guys, I feel like I'm third wheeling at this point, you know, but whatever. I'm coping. I'm coping. <laughs> Propose? He wouldn't like that. I ain't ready yet. I ain't ready yet. <laughs> How am I after yesterday's counting? Uh, I feel fine, but I don't feel... I feel much better than I did right as it finished, because goodness me, once it finished, I felt like a bag of skin. I've never felt so used and wasted like I was after I finished counting. Counting to 10,000. That is something else. 10,001, 10,002, 10,003, 10,004. I will end this stream right now. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're enjoying it's a million your next, isn't it? No, a hundred thousand. That's what uh, Mr. Beast did. Mr. Beast did it, but I'm not Mr. Beast. <laughs> you're my beast. Thank you. But I don't want to be him. I don't want to build Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. I don't want to put a PS5 in a circle and tell anyone who P stands in the circle for 48 hours they can have the PS5. Oh. That ain't me. Oh. Although he I is. feel like we've nerded out about so much cinema right now. Like, let's look at those hashtags. I, I was, feel like we should do that. I was saying the exact same thing. I think there are a few good questions here. So, <laughs> this is a good one. This is mm. from uh, Kuju Sankyu, who makes some very interesting fan art uh, for me. There are mm. two questions. One, is there a memory that really makes you cringe? And two... Can you try to switch personalities for a moment? Okay, a memory that really makes me cringe. Yes. Oh yeah? I got dared to sing on stage once when I was in school and I forgot the lyrics to no. the song I was singing. <laughs> I completely blanked, and I did not know what to say. <laughs> and I just like mumbled my way through that. And the occasional line that I knew, I sang clear as day. But after that, it was just mumbling. And I've never wanted to sink beneath the earth more in my life. 
It was pain. I would never wish upon that to my worst enemy. It was awful. I'm trying to recover from that. It was, it, it was bad. It was bad. I know that I'm the only one that remember this moment to this day because it was just a blip on everybody else's radar that were present. Not to me. To me, it haunts me to this day. That's the thing about cringe. Every time you cringe, you learn. Every time you cringe, you grow. Mm. And you are a bigger man now than you were. And you walk, walked mm. up on that stage and didn't know what to sing. I know that now, given that opportunity, you would walk up there and you would sing a solo that we would all die to hear. <laughs> You're giving me too much credit. <laughs> no, I'm not giving you too much credit. I mean, have you heard your own voice? <laughs> have you heard your own karaoke? <laughs> And the thing is, like, as a, like, part-time audio boy, aside from the pen, I am forced to listen to myself quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, it's something you get used to, but not never something that you grow to like. You, as a voice actor, I'm sure can relate. I kind of feel that, like, there's sort of... There's a balance to it, where before I became sort of a voice talent, I didn't like the sound of my own voice. And then after that, you sort of, it becomes a part of your career and you get used to it. But still, watching VODs back can be a mixed bag. You know, it can be a mixed bag when you watch clips or VODs, where sometimes you'll hear yourself talk and you think, damn, yeah, that's a guy with a nice voice. And sometimes you listen to it and you're like, Ugh. you know, because it's difficult to predict when your voice will break like you try stretching it and then suddenly you go like huh! and I listen to that and I'm like huh. That's why I'm always so apprehensive about voicing female characters because sometimes I feel like I do a palpable job other times it's just Oh, like, Ivy is uh I, mm. I just sound like Mickey Mouse. I I wish I was a consistent as Luca. I genuinely mm. envy Luca his consistency. Luca is something else. I mean, like like I know I know everyone loves Voxan, but I mean, I'm Vox. Okay, the thing, Vox, let, let, me, let me lay some, like, real facts on you right now. Even though, like, a lot of people wouldn't say, like, oh, Vox is a base. He doesn't have the range to sort of tap into, like, the, the feminine range to, like, be convincing. B.S. If you go back and watch the off collab, the say, like, Ninja UK Gen 2, when you <laughs> go into Vox and say, Oh my god, I haven't seen girls for su such a long time. I am not joking with you. You genuinely made me confused. Because you got the intonation, the inflection, and the because you don't, you're don't, you not like me where you have to sort of go up into a whispery range to even reach that sort of like um, convincing thing. The fact that it still sounds connected in terms of like uh, uh, different vocal ranges like chest voice, mixed voice, and head voice. Like, it's still, it sounds good. Genuinely, if you focus on developing that, you are a force to be reckoned with. Well, I never thought I'd hear that. Thank you so much. I... See what I mean? <laughs> I guess I'll try my best for you. I... Mm. 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 Listen, listen. To me, I said that and I was like, ugh. It sounds like me me putting something on, but to me, Ivy sounds like a real person. No, no, like if 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 you go into like the like the na, 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 oh my god, I haven't seen you girl for such a long time. Like oh if you go god, up and I haven't seen you girls in such a long time. That that exactly like holy crap! Ah! Like it's there. It's there. We're learning that Ike might be a simp for Voxan to an extent. No, 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 like the thing is, like I don't, I don't recall simping for anybody. I don't even simp for Miku. Like the, 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 even that is too much for me. The only person I, I recall simping for is Leon from Resident Evil Two. <laughs> <laughs> 
Valid, 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 valid. Leon is a very handsome boy. Oh my god, he's such a pretty boy. Oh my god, I love Leon so much. I still haven't finished Resident Evil 2. I need to do it. I oh got god, really I got really overwhelmed by like all the puzzle gameplay and like the amount of just It's very similar to a horror RPG in a way, isn't it? Like the way you I need know, to but go to a side of the, the map. Original. The original is puzzles out the wazoo. Find a random key that relates to a random door or something like that and like the horror takes a backseat to you know wandering a place and finding your way through you know it's it's a really interesting I experience. think they interlock beautifully hmm man like the thing the thing with Resident Evil 2 you have Leon you have Claire you have oh Claire Ada Wong like it mm. is by panic the game thinking about those three again Mm-mm. Oh. Sold. 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 Just say we need to create Resident Evil 2. <laughs> 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 All right, that was a good answer. That was a good answer. Now, there's another question here. Oh, we forgot to change personalities. Can we switch personalities for just a moment? Like, do they mean, like, just swap to something else besides ourselves? Or do you mean, do they mean, like, swap with each other? A swap with each other. Okay, I can, I can, tr I can try, I can try channeling my inner lord. Okay, I'll try channeling I Givend. Okay, from three, two, two one. one. Well then, my dear novelist, or would you bless me with the next question? Well, anyway, um, so this next <laughs> uh, question- that's the Ike I know. This- Never um, giving me an inch. Hey, this next question goes from, uh, uh, Lelaine TW, who, uh, draws a lot of very nice fan art for us, uh, to Ike Evelyn, uh, do you have any Vocaloid songs that you want to recommend to Vox? Oh, I am not very well versed in this area, so by all means, I am looking forward to your- Incredible intellect on this particular subject. Um, um, <laughs> you know, you know, um, uh, Miku, um, <laughs> Miku, <laughs> Miku. Okay, wait, no, okay, I understand. Uh, might not be the best question for you. I've got another one. Uh, what are the top three memes you like the best? Mm, that is a very good one. Very, very good one indeed. Well, as of recently, obviously, uh, well, maybe not recently at this point, but it is one that carries a sort of uh, infinite sustainability to it. It is timeless, which is <laughs> the French. <laughs> the French. <laughs> That's one I like very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. Uh, I feel so stiff. Oh god, I can't same. be. I can't be that. I can't be as restrained as you are. Like you're so. I can't be as unhinged as you. Like no. part of me just wanted to lean into the microphone and go. Mm. But I just don't have that in me. Quildren, clip that. Those crumbs, you gotta save those no! for the next- You gotta save those for the fucking Mexican winter. No! You're not getting them back for another eight months. <laughs> I just exhaled too hard into my drink and it went all over my sock. That's the thing, right, about giving fan service is that I, I love doing it, but also it has less impact after a while. Like when you, I remember I saw this diagram recently and it was of like each fan based on how much fan service they get. And the Quildren and the, and the, uh, the Kindred were practically overweight with the amount of fan service they get. They were like, oh yes, some I could do with a fan service entree right now. Whereas the Yaminians were like, oh, I remember the time he meowed five months ago. Oh, oh my God. Fantastic. <laughs> the poor Yaminians. Give them potassium, some... um, potassium deficiency. He wasn't even, he wasn't even on his own stream, he was on mine in the Jump King stream, and he breathed heavily. He was like, ha, 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 and everyone was like, oh my god, oh my god, she was breathing. <laughs> it was something quite, quite, quite bizarre. But it is a good question, actually. Where what? were the Quildren? Were they, like, after Shu? I think the Quildren were, like, next up after Shu, yeah. And then, so it went me, Mr. Lucub's Quildren, your minions. 
Mmm. You guys will get your time. Just be patient. <laughs> <laughs> now you guys gotta remember, this man has told me his plans. You will get your time. Oh yeah, I did! I did tell you! You will get your time. I ain't saying shit, but you're gonna get your time. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Moving on. This is a good question. What are your top three favorite memes of all time relative to their hilariousness and the time at which they were released? I think this is a good question. E. E is up there. I'm sorry. E. E. It's, it's just funny. E is always funny. It's fun to say. There's a picture of Markiplier going E. Yeah. What's not to like? I kind of agree. Um, what's another one? Uh, well, I'm trying to think of one. Uh, you think of one as well. All right. For me, it's an easy question. Mm -hmm. I believe that one of the greatest memes of all time is Harambe. Let me just, can you imagine like 10 years in the future and they'll be like, Mr. Evelyn, can you tell us about 2000 and what year was it? 16, Two May 22nd, 2016. May, May 28th, 2016. Yeah. So I, when they tell me that, I'm just going to pound myself a fat glass of vodka and just going to be like, all, all right, little Timmy, sit down. It all started with this fucking gorilla. <laughs> when I woke up. On the 28th of May, I looked at my TV with tears running down my cheeks. Harambe. Harambe. Also, Why did you what go? was the whole thing with, like, people putting their, you know, out for Harambe? Was it in... So, I believe the origin of the dicks out for Harambe thing was, uh... Danny Trejo, who is uh, an action star, he's, um, so in real life, Danny Trejo is a very uh, well-known uh, animal rights activist, actually. You know, he's very involved in preservation, conservation, all that kind of stuff. And uh, some people with, like, some phones, they found him and they came up and they asked him about it. And they said, yo, what do you think about Harambe? He said, yeah, dick out for Harambe. And it just kind of <laughs> stuck. And I think dicks out is kind of, I believe to him... It was slang meaning like, get your guns out for Harambe, like get your arms out, you know, like flex for Harambe. But to us, mm. it just means pull your cock out for Harambe. No! <laughs> Talk about rocking out with your cock out, you know. <laughs> oh my goodness. Something about well, Harambe was amazing because it united the, us. No one was in, happy. In a way, in a way, it is a way of saluting. So See, who am I to judge? Who are you to judge? I mean, that's the thing about Harambe is that everyone was upset. They knew that he had the right to live. He was an innocent gorilla. He was trying to protect mm. that child. And then everything went wrong. And ever since mm. then, you know, everyone acting as though like Harambe dying was the most intense cultural event that has happened in the past 28 years was... Effective in a way. I wanted to become a part of it, of that movement. You know, I didn't know Harambe personally until he died, but I was affected by it and I felt sad. And for me, I've never felt more united by a meme than I did by Harambe. Although, he was such a beautiful gorilla, man. Such a big boy. He was a big, he was a big <laughs> Boy. Everyone beat your chests in unison with Harambe. Big boy with big dreams, man. Speaking of a boy with big dreams, I think you'll relate to this one. Mm. I'd say it's sort of tied for my number one. Speaking of number one, we are number one. Mm. 2017. My man. Stefan Carl. The meme that almost saved a man's life. <sighs> Rest in peace. Now that's something I can stand tall with all my pride as a novelist with every single pen stroke I've ever put to paper 
and salute. Everyone, please, dicks out for Stefan Carl. That I man walked through on a red carpet through the Golden Gates and had God himself just gesture as, welcome, my liege. We are there number is one. no other way that that man entered paradise. Everyone, give us a salute. I was flabbergasted by the amount of trends that We Are Number One gave birth to, right? It was the, the birth of YouTube videos that are this song but this. It began with We Are mm. Number One. It was We Are Number One but it's this. We Are Number One but it's sped up. We Are Number One but it's slowed down. We Are Number One but it's reversed. We Are Number One but it's mixed with and then suddenly you have song mixes. Suddenly you have like movie crossovers. Suddenly you and have every new characters. single one linked to the GoFundMe. And while eventually Stefan Karl, you know, he did pass away for a long time his GoFundMe for his treatment was kept afloat by those memes. Those people who wanted to keep him alive and to show him love did so through that meme. It was a meme built upon charity, and which is why it, I believe it to be genuinely timeless. And also mm. built on a banging fucking song, a genuinely good song. Yo, can we talk about the composer for Lazy Town and just children shows in general? like? The Lazy Town and Backyardigans have some mm. of the most banging tunes. Holy crap. The Backyardigans have such bangers. Same with Lazy Town. Holy crap. We all talk about the We Are Number One. The composers did not have to go that hard. We all talk but about they We did. Number One. But you remember the fucking Stingy song? I'm stingy and it's mine. Mine. Like the... <laughs> I'm stingy and it's mine. <laughs> like... The, do you know that Lazy Town is the most expensive children's show ever made? I have heard the budget for that was insane. One million dollars per episode. There's so much CGI in Lazy Town, like you don't even realize it. Mm-hmm. And like puppet work, green screen, it's nuts in the sets. You'll have to excuse me, you know the thing with alcohol that it goes right through you? I'll be right back, I need to use the washroom. Bro, <laughs> me too. I was just gonna grab another one. I haven't had to pee yet. I haven't had to pee yet, but goodness me if I don't feel quite outdone <laughs> by my G&Ts. Um, 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 I just imagine if this was a, like, a real sort of late night television talk show. Can you imagine, like, seeing, what's his name, fucking, I don't know, some very famous actor like Adam Driver going on Jimmy Fallon. And halfway through the show, Jimmy Fallon's like, hey, uh, like, Adam Driver's like, I've got to take a leak. And he goes off and then Jimmy Fallon just sits there eating chips the whole time. God damn. Oh, oh, fuck me. Oh, 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 I've swallowed my, oh, that went, that definitely went down the wrong hole. Fuck me. Oh, oh. It's like I'm leaving so much, either for like food, drinks, or something else. I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it, man. I'm choking on my chips right now. I'm like, oh, chips. Do you mean? Do you mean like fries? Yeah, fries. In the UK, we call yeah. them chips. Right, right, right. I keep forgetting about that. It's so confusing. Chish and fips, we call them. 
Shish and Fips. Yeah. <coughs> ah! Don't die. Right, m moving on. I feel like we keep forgetting about the hashtags all the time. Yeah. Let's keep going. Well, each question, you know, it derives from those hashtags. I mean, it's a sign. Mm. It's a sign that we got, <coughs> you know, that chemistry. We just take one hashtag and we take it to a million miles. Mm. Oh, God. From mm. a regular of mine, we have from Meowie. Vox and Ike, give us your best metal scream. Mmm. Let me just warm up a little bit. <clears throat> you see, usually this is difficult when I'm drunk, but for whatever reason, it's working okay today. <clears throat> <gasps> There we go. Oh, fair play to you, mate. Um. <laughs> <coughs> so, we're. <coughs> the only time. See, <coughs> the thing is. <coughs> you see me do this in person. I have, I am. Can I tell you guys something? So, this morning. Um, hang on. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. Uh, this morning, my members and I, we watched School of Rock, which is a oh. banging fucking film. Would you agree with me? One of the best feel-good films ever made. Yeah! Yeah! See, Ike is based. I told you he was based. I would say that I've met you in person, and the energy that you have when you sing reminds me of Jack Black from School of Rock. Like, you are giving me too much credit. Jack Black is an icon. Jack Black is an icon, born to play that film. But let me tell you, when we, when Ike is in that karaoke booth, he's holding the mic in his hand, he's throwing his head back and forth, his hair is banging from side to side, and he's going, yeah! You know, like, he's fully into it, like, swallowing the microphone and not letting it control him. Like, I've never seen a man with that much. And you're also, like, doing the thing where you sort of, like, Foot to foot, like you're putting your foot from side to side, like da 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 da. The band is mine. How can you kick me out of what is mine? You know, like you have his energy, I think. And my my mom loves that film. Aku Mama loves that film. I told her about that. And and, she, and by the way, you're you're Aku Mama. You're, you're you're my mom's Oshi, by the way. And I told and I told That's her about that. That's another mom to add to the pile. <laughs> Ike what is slaying everyone's moms. moms. What is with me and mums? So, it's it's really funny, like, right around when we debuted, my mom got out of, like, a pretty major surgery, and she's fine now. But while she was recovering, she was watching us, like, the boys. And it was oh. weird for her to watch her own son. And so she sort of started watching, and you and Luca are her favorites, and I, I won't, <laughs> I won't ever get over after that, she, like, it was mainly you. And then I did the Spy Party collab with Luca, and she was like, Vox, I I just think that Luca is amazing. The way that he laughs at every little thing. I think he's such a sweet boy. Please tell him this from me. And I was like, all right, mom. And like, but I mean, I agree. I mean, Luca, I don't think I've ever seen someone who always has like a smile fixed on his face 24-7. You know, everyone in Luxium just has their own unique quirks and happy little, happy little sort of uh, traits that I think appeals to every different person. And for my mom, it was just kind of funny that, like, I at least if I may be a little bit self indulgent and say mm. that I'm kind of known for smiling a lot, I, I'm just a, like a happy person. I do smile a lot, but in my official, like, display artwork, I am just always. <laughs> the way he flipped it, that was really funny. <laughs> it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, moving on. Uh, yeah, Akumama, Gluka. But yeah, that was it. You know, she basically just said, she basically just said, like, yes, I think it's fantastic that he likes everyone. But before she watched the Spy Party collab, she was watching all of your streams and thought you were, like, just really smiley and bubbly and happy. And she was like, oh, I just think Ike Evelyn is the most, is the sweetest boy I have watched. And she genuinely became, like, a fan of yours for a while. That's so sweet. And then, um, Selene's uh, 
mama, uh, well, not her mama, but like, like uh, Tatsuki mama is like, uh, she she watches me enough to know that I talk about caviar a lot to the point where she wanted to try it herself. So, uh, Tatsuki mama, Quildren confirmed? Question mark. I don't know. Yeah, if Tatsuki it means mama, anything, Vox, Aku mama, uh, all Quildren. Ike mama watch has only watched streams from two Luxia members. The first one is me because she's biased. The second one is you. <laughs> So, I don't know what she has seen, but that is what she told me. Ah, 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 ah. Whenever someone in real life admits to watching me, it feels less like a, oh, wow, and more like a confession. Oh, no. <laughs> more like a, oh, what have you seen? You know, I think with my content, at least, there's a bit of a separation with real life, and then I think something about the off collabs we've had, and you've spoken about friends of yours or family members of yours who've watched me, and I'm like, oh no. What is that? My condolences. What have they seen? The things <laughs> with you, it's sort of like a 50 50. Other, uh, uh, like one time, you can get like a funny collab, like, uh, like, um, Prop Night, where everything is just, uh, chaotic shenanigans or Fall Guys, which is like a good old fun. And then there's, uh, the other ones. Yeah. The headphone ones. You know, the headphone ones. Nothing sussy about that. It's completely normal. Normal content. Suitable for the whole family. Okay. As a person who hasn't indulged in all of the Vox Akuma ASMR lore, which one got the closest to getting you age restricted? There's only one that has been age restricted. It act and it wasn't by your own hand. It was not by my own hand. It was manually reviewed and age restricted by YouTube. And I imagine you've heard of it. It was the Office ASMR. I knew it. That one had a spicy but limited pre premise where it's essentially drama between two people at an office you and your boss and he approaches you in a closet and says yo you need to improve your performance and all that and tries to bully you the office door the the closet door will not open and all of the tension between the two people me and the listener comes out all at once and at the end well everyone knows about the great the great guac guac incident of 2022 what is um, a guac do you really want me to tell you? Will it get this stream demonetized? Probably not. What is a guac? What act, What sex act makes you go wah, wah. I don't know. That sounds like a gagging noise, and like Just... most of them, because like I'm done. I'm not really. Uh. <laughs> It is when one places a penis within one's mouth. Okay, that's enough! <laughs> but essentially, that's how it went. We were up, I tried to make my ASMR about two hours long. We got to about an hour and 40, and I was like, I am running out of ideas. And the chat was full of, the chat was full of like, do this, do that, do this, do that. And I thought, well, I have to do something. I need to fill up the last 20 minutes. And so that was what happened. This was allowed on YouTube. Surprisingly, yes. It did not get me a community guideline strike. It just received age restriction. That is so weird because I'm about to drop some Ike Evil and Lord on you. On Ike Evil and Lore. I have a memes playlist. Oh, yeah? And I've been building this memes playlist over the course of two years. There was over 2,000 videos in that thing. How incredibly sexy of you. Do go on. All of them were, like, were really funny. It w I, w I shared it with like with some people, and they were just like, Ike, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Every single video is a banger. I don't know how you find these things, but even on my most sad days, I watch this playlist, and it's just never-ending guffaws. Like, I love it. And that playlist unlisted 
for nobody except the people that I deemed worthy were allowed to witness. It got striked for community guidelines. And the reason that it was striked, like, it, I thought at first, there's, like, the YouTube bots deemed it to be in violation. And bots make mistakes. So I appealed it. Because the reason that they gave it made no sense. So I appealed it. And they upheld their decision. But they changed the reason that it was striked. Because what? originally, the reason that it was striked was something so inane, so out there, so nonsensical that had nothing to do with funny memes and TikToks on YouTube. So they changed it to, uh, should I even say this? Like, because it wasn't this, but it's like, it, the, the, like, it, okay, so w I, let me give you an idea. If you guys have ever seen the important videos playlist, oh, yeah. it was like that. Oh yeah. It, it was essentially that, They're just like video of somebody like slapping a table, like, going like, and then he headbutts the table with all his might and goes, yes. It was things like that over and over and over. And just like somebody, it just funny things galore and memes and shit posts and all that stuff. And it got deleted and they, they changed the reason it got deleted for child endangerment. Ch what? What? Memes? It was memes. I bet you there was like one video on there that was that there was that kid in a little cardboard box being like, "It's me falling down the stairs." No, like, I, I, I think about like you know, you the, know. The, the the video of the guy is eating be or like the little kid eating beans and toast, and then he goes the ice cream and he falls on the floor. <laughs> that was in there, so that that might have been the one. Like I don't know. But how? That's not child endangerment. That's a child being a dickhead. Like we were all when we were I children. Know. Like the one of the kid. Like the one of the kid who turns blue and fucking dies. You know, he just sat staring what? at a computer and then he turns blue and he goes ah ah. You know. I haven't even. The, the, I don't recognize that. So that wasn't in there. Let me send you this shit. It's really funny. Well, like there's another one with like a kid holding like an ice cream and he goes the ice cream and then he drops it and then he starts crying. And then they edited that into the fairy fountain theme of The Legend of Zelda, and I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. That's the kind of stuff that was in there. Why did that get deleted? That was two years of work! Over 2,000 videos! All gone. Over All one gone. kid. Dust oh. in the wind. Over one kid. <laughs> I've never seen this video before, but you saying just the ice cream, oh, and then just pull. Yeah, oh. you know it. You know it. <laughs> Hang on, let me watch this shit. Let me watch this. Shit, 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 shit. I mean, I didn't recommend it. Maybe, 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 maybe it got content. deleted because they knew for the fact that, like, when I watched like <laughs> videos of kids being stupid and suffering the consequences of their own actions. They know that on the inside, I'm just like, fuck them kids. I also accidentally played like one second of the video I was talking about <laughs> on stream just now. Like I hit the back button after unmuting YouTube and then he went, ah, like. <laughs> 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 I love how like there's, I think there's a, there's a merit to like memes that have a short shelf life. You know, because yes, because it's just you go to a channel like unusual memes or the important videos playlist or whatever it is, and there are some that's just like, you know, someone with like a a bottle of pop and they shake it up and then they drop it and it flies oh, through the, the air. Oh, the fact you call it pop makes you so based. <laughs> and then it just flies through the air and hits someone in the head, and then like you would never. It's not really a format that expands beyond the the individual video, but. It's still a meme that has longevity and something that you can remember, right? Mmm. Ah, uh, <laughs> man. It's like, like, I think I've just gotten so used to it being called pop. Like, whenever somebody calls it soda, I'm just like, huh? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. 
I don't even know if we in the UK have a word for it. Like, we don't call it pop. We don't call it soda. We just call it like, I don't know. It's a like, do you, do you want a fizzy drink? A fizzy drink. Do you want a fizzy drink? Do you like some Coke? Would you like? <laughs> I I will never. I mentioned this on my Donut County stream when you when we were in the off collab and you and you offered me a can of Coke and you're like, do you want some bonk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 it was like it, it, okay. So what, the reason for that is like because you know conk and bepis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I just combined that that with like the meme of replacing the first consonant with a B, so it just became bonk. Bonk. I still call it bonk. It's such a funny way of calling it. It's way better than coke. Yeah. Oh fuck. My gin, it just hit the back of my throat. Ow, that hurt. Oh, Jesus. Oh, no. I, uh, uh, <laughs> I hate that time. Like, you know when you're drinking alcoholic drinks and you get a bad gulp? And oh, it's just like... Oh, yeah. You have to like, okay, my my taste buds did not like that. My stomach did not like that. So I'm going to have to fight back um, nausea for the next 30 seconds. You know, it's it feels like... You know the aneurysm sound effect? Hmm? The the it's the heavy from TF2 going. I, I I've not played enough TF2 to know that no. Aneurysm sound effect. Let me send you this. Chat knows what I'm talking about. At least I would hope they do. My lips are kind of tasty right now. I just played it on I just played it on the stream by accident. <laughs> My lips are kind of tasty. Hey Chad, when I have a taste. Uh, is this the it. one? I have it. I have a taste of what now? Oh, I never heard about that before. <laughs> that sounds funny. Have a taste of what now? I don't know. I don't want to. I forgot what I just said. Mm. And that is true. That's kind of full circle, actually. Isn't like a bonk sort of a big part of TF2 back in the day? You know, the scout. Oh, yeah, the scout. scout TF2. Bonk. Bonk. Say goodbye to your kneecaps, Chucklehead! Yeah! Oh my god, the Meet The series, and it's just copyrighted, lol 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 lol. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me, did you ever watch Arby and the Chief? I don't know how into Halo you were. I, I, I was never really that into Halo. I played Halo Reach with my buddies, like, you know, going around someone's house and playing Halo Reach on the Forge mode and just spawning in ghosts everywhere, you know? Oh, yeah, like, there used to be this, like, I... Um, I used to watch the crap out of Machinimas, which was just like mm -hmm. short in-game skits made in the Halo 3 engine using the theater mode. And But there was this one dude called Digital Fear that just decided to go outside of that. He has still incorporated the theater mode and creating skits in scenes within the game engine. But he also had this action figure of the Arbiter and the Chief, hence Arby and the Chief. And they just lived sort of Toy Story-esque lives in this one apartment by this dude called John. And Chief was just this, like, internet shitlord, like, memeing it up all the time, being incredibly toxic, incredibly selfish, bigoted in every sense of the word, and RB just sort of being the voice of reason. And they got up to so many weird shenanigans. It, it led, like, I have not laughed that hard at a YouTube series in such a long time. It re led to the phrase of the creation of my my raffle knife goes slice, slice, slice. And well, I haven't the, heard raffle in a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, the sound effect for that goes with the raffle copter. I mm. believe it's from that show. I'm not joking. I think it's from that show. Every That's the strange thing about the internet is that everything has an origin, but no, virtually no one knows what those origins are. Every sound effect that you hear, every meme that you watch came from somewhere, and chances are you mm. don't know where that place is. At least, this young- this damn younger generation doesn't know where it's from. <laughs> Us old boys have been around for hundreds of years, you know, I mean, you- I've been around for that long, you sort of came from a long time ago, like, we Read yeah, the all literature I know from that is time. my own timeline and this timeline. Everything in between I had to find out through books. Man! Reading's hard. It is. Yeah, I don't read. You're missing out, man. I am missing out, but I just don't have the energy. I mean, I barely watch anything. Like, you know, sitting down in front of my TV oh, to, crap. like, watch Obi-Wan. Like, that was, like, the most 
like the longest form of entertainment that I watched by myself in a long time. I'm just overwhelmed by everything else. Are you alright, Ike? Yeah. <laughs> I've kinda... Whoa. It's like the past couple of golf stalls hit me once. Did you someone 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 slip some plant matter into your fucking drink or something? No, or are you good? It's just me here, man. It's me here, man. What are you seeing right now? I'm looking at yeah. my son. It's so square. No. <laughs> are you it's sure like, that's just alcohol you've been drinking? No, it's it's, it's <laughs> like, dude, you don't understand. It's rectangles, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my audio interface, that's a rectangle as well. No, it's not the audio interface. It's the acoustic treatment. Oh. It's the acoustic treatment. I see. That's the rectangle. Right. I, what is an acoustic tree? Please tell me. An acoustic treatment. You, oh. know, you know the foam. Oh, yes. No, I have that as well. I thought, all right, now that I know what yeah. you mean. Yeah, the foam. I've got foam it's all over my office, foam. too. foam. Man's really looking at rectangles. Now I'm thinking back to when you played The Witness and your stream was just called Sorkles. Oh, my God, The Witness. I want to, you know the parody version? The, the Looker. Looker. Yeah. I have not played it. I'm not, I've watched like two minutes of it from Selen Senpai stream. I feel like if anybody is qualified to play the looker and appreciate the piss take, it should be me. You gotta play it. You gotta play it. I mean, I've seen the video game video. I still didn't finish the witness because my head was so in pain <laughs> from how weird and difficult and mind-numbing it got. I still see circles and lines to this day and I just go, <laughs> circle. <laughs> How it's like bad, dude. how are it's you bad. with puzzles normally? Because me, I have a reputation. I am terrible at puzzles. Like in any game. Honestly, I think I got pretty far. Hey chat, anybody was present for the witness streams? I did above average. Like I got pretty far. You gotta give me that, right? Before he just gave up and said, fuck this. No, you don't understand how difficult it gets. It starts out so simple. And then they ask the most inane things of you. And you, you you sort of learn different rules of the game in different parts of the map. And then during the final area, it throws like five of those rules at you at once. And you got to keep them all in account. Fucking hell, mate. Like one of them is, I am not joking you. Do you know what pitch accent is? No. Okay. So... In many languages, like uh, like for example, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Japanese, it's like the way that you say a word, your pitch in your voice changes the meaning of the word. Right. For example, like um, in Japanese, there's like hashi and hashi, which is the difference between chopsticks and bridge. That is very weird. It reminds me of yeah, when I was learning. Yeah, one of the um, puzzles in The Witness. When you go into like a jungle, there is a bird like chirping at you and you don't know what to do. You need to draw a line between point A to point B and you have three ways of doing it. You can go through the center, you can go the top route, or you can go the bottom route. But the, re the, the correct answer is not stated to you until you listen to the bird, which might go like, and that tells you go high, then low and not the middle route. And then you might go uh, here, which is mid, mid, high, low, mid. And you gotta hear that. If you're not musically inclined, I can imagine that being a nightmare. I'm having, I'm having a small panic attack on the idea of genuinely playing that and trying to figure that out for myself. The thing is, because I played that, because I enjoyed it, I just wanna see other people experience it. I want to know what it's like for other people to like go through that because I can't be the only one that thought that some of that stuff was just like, how the heck am I supposed to understand this? By the way, why have you not modded Kyo? I literally what? said I did it just now. Niji Sanji of 
by the year 2030, everyone, every single member of the Earth population is going to be a member of Niji Sanji, okay? It's taken a mm. while for me to get to it. When they turn up in my chat, I shall do it as and when I need to, okay? I mod them before debut. Well, you're a very hardworking and very caring senpai. Me, I am disorganized and I forget these things. And that's okay, it's okay. too. okay, I understand. I know, I, I love stuff son. stuff son and magic son are so wonderful to yeah. us, but sometimes I wake up and I see 17 slack pings, then I just go, I'm so sorry, I'm I'm not in the headspace for this today, I, I will do it. Yeah, tomorrow. it's difficult, right? Because you, we sign up for this being like, I'm gonna make streams, and then when you get into Niji Sanji, it's like, okay, well there's merch. And there's voice packs, and there's this, and there's that, and it's like, ugh. it's a wonderful opportunity, but sometimes it's like so much more than you sign up for, and then you just sit there and you look at it, and every morning you wake I up and there's like for this. 17, <laughs> I didn't sign up for this, and there's like 15 different things you have to do, and it's like, alright, well, I'm gonna go get some breakfast first, um, you know, I mean, maybe that'll resolve itself before I get a chance to look at it. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like uh, I, I, I'm I'm aware that I am I'm guilty of being a procrastinator, unfortunately. But like I, I try my best, always. But uh, the thing with procrastinators and people, I the thing with me is like I've never gotten tested for any sort of like disorders beyond depression. Mm. It's like, I don't know anything about dyslexia or ADHD, so like, I I don't feel comfortable like speaking and like, if I have any of those, I know that I've like e exhibited symptoms of we each, but I don't want to say anything until like a medical professional has like evaluated me. Mm. But whenever like I, like if somebody drops like maybe three things on me and like tasks at once, I can do that. I can like, okay, I, I, I can handle it. If I wake up to more than 10, then I will be like, oh, this is too much for my mental state right now. I will do it a little bit later. Plot twist, I don't do it later. Mm -hmm. And then it just sort of spirals from there. And it's something I feel immensely guilty about. Because I want to get better at that. I want to get better. Because I know that by being a procrastinator and not being as efficient that I know that physically speaking, I should be able to be... I'm holding others back. And if there's one thing I hate, it's being a burden to anybody else in no, any way, shape, or form. That's the last thing I ever want to be. I agree, man. I, I, I kind of get the same thing where, you know, sometimes all these extra jobs, they can feel really overwhelming, but you know people are counting on you and mm. it's a lot of pressure to get used to you know it's like it's not as though you're mad at anyone who gives you those jobs because they need them to be done but you're also upset because you wish you had a more time to yourself and b more motivation to do those jobs as well and you know it's it's interesting uh, actually um interesting fact uh that i should that i probably um i'll probably mention it eventually but i actually have for me, I have an appointment now. I'm gonna go and see a psychiatrist on the in October uh, because that's the earliest I could get it to go and try and be diagnosed with something, you know, whichever one it is. Mm. And because uh, I think it's an important step for most people to take because I feel as though more people suffer from these kinds of things than uh, they think they do, you know. And especially in UK culture, it's sort of become a thing where, especially if you're a man, you sort of feel as though, well, you know, if you got, if you're upset, suck you it just up. suck it up, right? mate. You know, be a you man. just, just you go down the pub, have a pint, you'll be all right in the morning. You know that kind of thing, and you know it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes because there's a balance, right? Like I agree, I think the only use really for self-diagnosis is just figuring out, oh, I might have this thing. Let me go and see a professional. But also the problem is seeing a professional is really expensive. You know, like even for yeah. me, even for me having this wonderful opportunity and, you know, getting all, you know, both all of us get like all these supers and all of this opportunity to like pay for stuff that we might need. Even for me, I'm like, damn, you know, just getting to know what's wrong with myself is expensive as hell. And mm -hmm. You think about what it must be like for everyone else. It's, it's, it's a shame. Not only that, there's the whole stigma, like the whole, 
masculinity thing. Like I know that mm. there's toxic masculinity of people thinking that, oh, I like I'm allowed to be this way because of like my assigned gender or like my uh, like what I feel that I am. But not only that, there's also like the reverse of it. Like because of who you perceive yourself to be, it's just like you can't experience this one thing. You can't be depressed. You can't be sad. You can't be abused. Yeah, like nothing like that. The and the thing is, whenever you do experience something like that, you second guess yourself. You should like, no, this isn't happening because I am the way that I am. I can't experience this, which is not true. Mm -hmm. Like depression knows no gender or lack of gender. Abuse knows no gender or lack of gender. Anybody can fall victim to terrible things. And seeking help for those things is nothing to be ashamed of. Asking for help is the most chad thing in the universe that you can freaking do. Because while you might be sold on the idea that it's strong to ignore your problems, true bravery is acknowledging that you're not okay. That takes a lot of bravery and being able to yes. say, you know what? I'm upset. Things in my life aren't perfect. I need help. That is an admission that you are in some ways weak and that you do need help. And that in some ways, in the way that it can weaken your own ego is really challenging. And anyone who manages to do that is strong and powerful. And I am very proud of you, whoever you are mm. listening. You and me and me and Ike, proud of you. Keep it up. Wherever you are in the world, at whatever time, be it a day from now, a month from now, a year from now, ten years from now, there's a blue novelist and a red demon who are always immensely proud of you, cheering you on every step of the way of your journey, wishing for you to succeed. Always. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but for me, I think that one of the most interesting parts of this experience is having regulars, you know, people who turn up and chat often, send supers often, that kind of thing, and hearing about their journey is really powerful, you know. And you mm. hear about someone who says, like, sometimes you'll you'll see a super from someone who says, you know, that maybe they see something innocuous, like, yeah, I haven't been feeling so well, but... I watched your stream and I had fun. And then th you don't hear from them for a few months. And then a couple months later, they say, yeah, I got diagnosed with this. And now I'm getting inducted. In, in, in I'm, I have a place in this new university that I applied for. And it's like, damn. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Or people saying that, like, I was struggling a little bit while I after I graduated. But now, uh, after wa uh, watching you for a little bit, like, that really kept my spirits high. And it allowed me to be in high enough spirits to apply for a job. And guess what? I got the job. That's beautiful. You could like, like nothing would make me happier than hearing you succeed in life. Even if it's not because of me, even if it was just like, hey, I succeeded, not necessarily because of you. I just want to tell you about something great that happened to me. Absolutely. I want to applaud your success, even if I had nothing to do with it, because you deserve that. I got nothing to add to that. That was really well put, my man. Hmm. Oh, God. We've already been going for more than three hours. Sheesh. It's been three freaking hours. Yeah, Holy man. Jesus. It depends. I mean, every other episode of Under the Table has ended after three hours, but if you want to keep going, we can just keep chatting. I don't mind at all. I don't mind. I got plenty of boost to go through, man. Let's do it. All right. I've got an interesting question for you from another one. Oh, hit me with it from uh, Voxu on Twitter. Since you've had prior experience, what kind of Lolita or Lolita-inspired outfit would suit Vox, in your opinion? Hmm. It's gonna be black-themed. It's mm -hmm. gonna have frills. The frills are gonna have red trims to them. You're gonna have sleeves, but they are gonna be detachable. Oh. Yes. You're gonna have thigh highs, 
they're gonna have a line going through them around the very top, around the Zetai Ryoiki, and it's gonna be frilly. That line itself is gonna be black. Thigh highs themselves are gonna be white. The shoes are gonna be r black. Ah, I see. Mm. Oh. I don't know why, but what you're describing, it kind of makes sense to me. I mean... The chest area is going to have a zipper that stops around the solar plexus. You sound... You, you, you sound like you've thought about this before. Like, that was a very... No, 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 I'm just using my... The, the, listen, my knowledge in Lolita fashion is very limited. Very limited. Mm -hmm. But the limited experience and knowledge that I have, I have immense respect for the Lolita fashion community. So anything that I might say that might be a little bit like um, uninformed, misinformed or anything, I deeply apologize. I'm just going off of what I have off the top of my head. Uh, you'd have a choker. Absolutely. A freely choker. <gasps> Hmm. Listen. You have long hair already that compliments you. Mm, you already have pretty pretty nice makeup. You could use a little bit more blush. With oh. all due respect. <laughs> yeah. Listen. I I, th I, th I think that's good. I think that th that would be really nice for you. I'll wait. I think to, that uh... your I think your your skirt should be short because you're gonna have thigh highs. You're gonna oh, yeah. be highlighting the zetai doiki. It's gotta be there. Why am I all flustered all of a sudden? Oh my goodness. Mm, you're so cute. Uh. Moving on. Moving on. Uh. Um. I. I. I I don't know how I, I I don't know how to run a talk show after after oh okay um but yeah uh mm, <coughs> yeah um uh mm. yes uh but yes on the same uh a plane uh yes yeah, certainly um a few years ago I recall I had an experience where not you know the leader fashion but I have I I have cross dressed before. And um, hey. I've been in, uh, I've sort of, not not too avidly, but when I have, I've sort of, you know, you have like, um, like female friends sort of dress you up and help you with makeup and that, and, uh, and every single time it's happened, they will be like, oh my God, why are you prettier than I am? And I'm like, <laughs> I, I know the feeling. One of the other thing is, you know, what's something that never happens to guys mm -hmm. get getting complimented on the street by a stranger. And not in the objectifying sort of way, like in the genuinely like, hey, uh, sorry, like you look really nice today. I hope you have a wonderful day. You don't like for anybody that is not a dude in the audience. When you tell us that, that stays with us for years. Yeah. You don't understand how much it means to us getting like complimented by somebody of the preferred like of the preferred sex whether that be male female both or neither it stays with us and the only time i have ever been complimented by a stranger it happened three times in the same day and that's when i went downtown in full Lolita. i got complimented by three strangers one of which was a old lady before i went on the bus when I like, I said, "Oh, you go before me." And when she heard heard my voice, she very clearly could tell that I was I was a boy in Lolita fashion. And she said, "Oh, thank you very much. By the way, you look really lovely." And that I still remember that. There was another lady that complimented me, and another uh, cute boy behind the counter when I was ordering a pizza. Because when I spoke, I don't think he expected my kind of voice to come out of what I was wearing. But I still think about that. I still remember that. And I hold it very dear. Because compliments from strangers on the streets like that, at least to me, or I think I speak for a lot of boys, regardless of uh, uh, 
level of masculinity, femininity, f- sexual preference, or anything, or gender identity, or anything like that, it stays with us. We we treasure those moments because they are very few and far between. Yeah, like, and I don't think you guys are really, you know, maybe like obviously there are some men in the audience, but uh, I think that it's difficult to really think about how rare it is and how impactful it is to give someone not like a sort of flirtatious like sort of a lascivious comment in public and be like yeah, yeah you know like a genuine sort of kind-hearted compliment to someone is especially to a man is so impactful like i've had them a couple of times but very and i've been on this earth for a long time they are few and far between the most what I've experienced is that maybe I'm hanging out with a friend or a couple of friends and then some people will walk past and then my friends will say, yo, they were checking you out and they and I will be like, huh? They were? What? And I just kind of look back and I'm like, oh, oh, nice. And I will never forget it. Every single occasion that that has happened, I remember it because it feels so rare, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to like, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I would do the exact same thing for you. You're a wonderful, handsome demon. I think you. I think you're a very handsome novelist, and all of those compliments <laughs> yeah. that you received in that lovely L- Lolita dress, I feel as though you deserved, and ten times more, even when not wearing it, because I think that your fashion sense is amazing, and the smile that you wear when you're in public is uh, second to none. You know. You're too kind. You're too kind. I, 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 ah. <laughs> oh, I need another drink. Oh my god. Mm, I'm kind of running out of this drink. After this, I think I'm going to crack into my Smirnoffs. I'm still like running on sours. Ooh, fair enough. The Smirnoff ice. Smirnoff ice. Very based. A big fan. Mm, not very, Not very heavy. But delicious. Super delicious. Yeah, a nice way of kind of keeping the night going without sort of deepening the situation much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I love this feeling. I love this feeling right now. Mm. You know, you know mm-hmm. what I would like right now? What would you like? Listening to some nostalgic music. I mean, I'm the one who's controlling the music on the stream, but if you want to listen to something it's of your copyrighted. own... It's copyrighted. If you want to listen to something of your own, just on your own end... Yeah, I want to listen to... Itsumono Fuke from Suzumiya Haruhi no Yutsu. Mm-hmm. And bring me back to 2006, 2017. Experiencing a magical show that would change my life forever. For the first time. Hey, have no. you ever watched Suzumiya Haruhi? I don't believe I have, no. What is the English name of that show? The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. I have heard of it, and I have friends who have seen it, and I do need to check it, it out. Is, it is beautiful. Beautiful show. With characters I wish were real, because I want them to be my friends. They are really, really wonderful. It's one of those shows that you watch... Throughout the entire thing, you feel like you're making friends. Mm. The one thing that shakes you up from it and letting you know that the the people you spent hours and hours getting to know aren't real is when the show ends. Mm. It's a really unique feeling. I highly, highly recommend it. Mm. It's a beautiful show. Be it sub or dub. Yeah. It's one of those dubs from the golden age of dubs where they got really, really good actors. They have Johnny Young Bosch. They have Crispin Freeman. They have yeah. Wendy Lee. Like fucking, like, like fucking Death Note. Actors. The Death Note dub is really, really good. Oh yeah. my god, I, 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 Alexander Giuliani as L. Mm. I think he genuinely did a fantastic job. Brad Swale also. I have a tremendous amount of respect for tre- uh, for Brad Swale, but I unfortunately have to admit my bias for uh, Miyano Mamoru San. Miyano Mamoru is the like Yagami for me. Completely based. Fair opinion. And I respect it 100%. Mm. God. 
Miyano Mamoru san is one of my favorite saves. He's even I even like his live action roles. I think he's a wonderful on camera actor. But I remember in this one, uh, I don't remember the name of the show. I just saw a clip of twi uh, from Twitter where Miyano Mamoru san is playing one of the characters and they're laughing at somebody's name because it's it, it, it can sort of be taken out of context as something sort of phallic. And instead of doing the stereotypical anime laugh, it just sounds like he's cracking up in the studio. And it's <laughs> beautiful. Like, it's the only time I've heard a genuine wheeze laugh out of an anime. It's God. beautiful. No, no, you're right. And I think that, like, it's interesting when voice acting goes, like, a, a realm beyond, you know, what's scripted. Have you ever seen the film? Uh, it's Charlie Kaufman. Have you ever seen Anomalisa? I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. So, I won't tell you anything about the plot other than it's a really good film. Um, but the thing about Anomalisa is that it is a stop-motion film where it was animated after the performances were recorded. And they had all of the actors in one room recording their lines together and so that their performances and their chemistry could reflect off of each other. And you can really see that in the animation you know like their org the organicness of a um uh of a conversation and the way that they interact is reflected in the lip syncing and reflected in the way the characters are animated and i don't think i've seen better acting in an animated production before that's incredible it's a very interesting film about uh sort of a man losing touch with reality because the main actor is played by david thewlis uh, the love interest is played by another actress, and every other character is played by one other actor, and they all have the same face. One. Every single one has the same, like, mask face stitched onto the model, and uh, it's about the main character losing touch with reality and feeling sort of as though he can't connect with anyone until he meets the main love interest who does have her own voice and face. You know, it's it's a it's a very interesting film, and obviously Charlie Kaufman, I believe, is someone who can do no wrong. I don't know if you've seen um, seen like the King of York or um, I, what's it called? I've read like a thesis about Synecdoche, but I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. Very the very only good. Kauf very Kaufman movie I've seen is Eternal Sunshine. Uh, I actually haven't seen that, although I know it's one that you I need to see. <gasps> yeah. Can we watch Eternal Sunshine together? Let's it's do one of the it. most beautiful things I, I've ever seen. In my I life. haven't seen Eternal Sunshine, sad, but I love but Jim Carrey, beautiful. so I need to I need to check it out. It's one okay, Jim Carrey in that I know that we think about Jim Carrey, we think funny rubbery face overacting. Him in Eternal Sunshine is one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever seen. Man, you're breaking my heart just the way you're talking about it, because I've been there like when you think about a certain film or a certain work of art and like it genuinely brings a tear to your eye before you even before, like when you're not even watching it, you know? Genuinely, like, I'm begging you, don't watch that movie without me. Okay, let's watch that together. We'll find time, certainly. Mm. Mm. It, it reminds me of, um, what is it? There's, there's, a, there's a scene from Star Wars Episode Seven that always makes me tear up, and when I describe it to people, it makes me cry a little bit. Like. Mm. I, I always, I guess it's because, like, for me, crying at films and TV always happens when I'm least expecting it. And when I'm watching a, like, a overproduced Hollywood Star Wars movie, I'm just expecting to, like, laugh and be like, Lamau, fun action. And mm. then, I'm, you know, but then there's that scene in episode seven where Leia and Han finally meet up after being sort of separated for a long time. And there's this knowledge that their son went on to, be, like, join the dark side and all that. And they sort of both of them and it makes sense in context because both of them have become these sort of um jaded army people who've like been leading a rebellion and han became a smuggler again leia sort of started leading an army and both of them are so closed off and they sort of joke at each other and they're like whatever the guy you motherfucker and then i think one of them i can't remember who it is but i think it's han says one thing about their son and they just kind of look at each other and then the facade drops and they just like hug that mm. all that always makes me cry because in a really i'm crying right now in a mm. really overproduced hollywood movie that is such a genuine moment because there's no That's like the thing like no like hyper realistic or hyper hollywood sort of like ah, 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 
It's just a moment where, okay, we're really upset. Come here. You know, between two people who never normally express that. That's you know? the thing. Even in the most overproduced, CGI-heavy Hollywood blockbuster, when there is a genuine display and well-acted portrayal of humanity, it gets people. That's mm. why Civil War, that one scene with Did You Know, hits so hard. That's yeah. why Koi no Katachi hits so hard, even from a person that doesn't use their words much because of their disability. Their actions speaks volumes about how they feel in in the whispers of the heart, or like, what? what is it? Kokoro ga sakebitai, nan dakke? Naka title wasuri chatta. Yo katara, dareka, chatto ran de, osiete kudasai, ano, ano ega no title, chotta wasuri chatta. Yo katara, osiete kudasai. Koi nasai. Huh? Eh, I'm trying to remember, like, kokoro ga sakebi. Mm, like, uh, I don't remember what the English title is, but it's like the cries of the heart. It's about somebody that has a really, really difficult time with speaking, but they're able to speak properly when they're singing. Oh. And it's such a beautiful movie oh. because it's, and say with wolf children, any movie that just is, regardless of a character's background, it's whisper of the heart of, chat is saying it's a display of humanity of human emotions of human connection that sounds beautiful i've never seen or heard of that but it sounds incredible you've never, you've never seen wolf children no my guy i know th i know three people that are gonna sit down and have ourselves a little viewing party <laughs> i guess we will we're gonna watch Eternal Sunshine. We're gonna watch Wolf Children. And we're all yeah. gonna have a good cry. Yeah. Uh, that uh, sounds uh, pretty good uh, to me. Uh, uh. I think there's nothing better than crying at a movie, though. Like, well, yeah, that's that's the thing. I hate that. Like, it's sort of like this boys don't cry mentality. Mm. Let boys cry. Let yeah. boys cry at movies. Let boy, boys cry at books. <laughs> Crying is a healthy thing. It's a display of human emotion. I like crying. I like getting. I like crying because of happiness. I like be crying, crying because of sadness. I like feeling like crap sometimes. I like feeling any emotion, regardless of it be happy or sad. It, it, lets, it lets me know that I'm alive. I still have my two feet on this earth. Regardless of what hardships I've gone through, I'm still standing here. Life is a rich and full experience. It is not 100% happy or 100% sad. It is full of everything. And every... How are you going to appreciate the mm. joy without a little bit of sadness? You can't have a rainbow without a little rain, to quote Baby Driver. Fucking Dolly Parton, let's fucking... Yeah! Like... Yeah! Dolly Parton and Baby Driver! Working 9 to 5! What working a way to make a living five. belly! Getting by! <laughs> How can you appreciate life if you don't appreciate all its aspects? Every happiness, mm. every sadness, every anger, every calmness, every connection, and every loss. Every mm -hmm. part of the life that we live is beautiful and whole and special in its own way. Even if when you experience it, it hurts, everything grows to become a part of who you are and who you are is really, really important. Yeah. I'm sorry to change the topic abruptly, but I am once again out. I'm going to get a refill. Man's getting a refill. Baba boy. Off he goes. I didn't expect today to get so passionate. Goodness me. I was like, yeah, me and me and the lad, we're going to have a drink. And then here we are talking about the human experience. Oh, it's nuts. I love it, but it's nuts. 
Oh, I'm just gonna lie back in my chair. Oh. What a guy. I hope we get to learn more from him. And learn more from him and the clunk of his kitchen. I'm officially out of sours. No. I am back and I'm cracking into the actual bottles. I'm having a strawberry drink right now He's and I actually had to get open a my cold one with the Yeah, boys. I had to use my bottle opener for this. And I still have my bottle openers that I made in all arts and crafts in woodcraft that I made myself. I polished it. I like I cut it out. I got it glossified. I don't know what it's called. And I had like the different pieces put together and hammered in like the little metal bottle opener thing. So I'm using a bottle opener that I made myself. He's not just a novelist. He's a fucking craftsman. Not at all. It's a big chunk of wood, but it fits really well into my hand. It's so easy to grip and it's opens bottles like nobody's business. Remember during the Niji UK Gen 2 when I just opened my Coke bottles against the table? My I man, kind of went, do you do you remember when we went to that bar and I asked the very, very large man who owned the bar, like, he gave me a bottle and I was like, um, excuse me, um, I don't believe you've given me a bottle opener. Could you open this for me? And he goes, <laughs> and he just pops the cap off with his bare fucking hand. I don't believe I was there for that. Oh, no, you won. So that was um, me, Nina, Mika, and Mister. We went to a bar. Um, but essentially, the man who owned this bar was this absolutely gigantic Arnold Schwarzenegger-sized... Are we Ara talking an absolute unit? He was an absolute unit. He was this Arabic guy, and, uh, like, he handed me my drink, and I had it there for a bit. And me being all nervous, I was like... <laughs> You alright? The carbonation went ham on me. Oh, did it like... Did you drink it or did like the... F it it, did it foamed fro over. No! Oh, I'm Listen. gonna have to wipe my desk! No! Pull a Vox Akuma and sip it off with your mouth. Just... Oh, I'm so sad. It's a shame when that happens. Like, you take one sip and then it's like, okay, time to come all the way out. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's just like, um, I don't care if I was like past like the the neck of the bottle. I am going to expand. <laughs> the alcohol itself has this, has this like conscience. And it's like, yes, I wish to grow. I'm not- I will not be contained by this bottle. I will expand beyond. Uh, I'm not looking forward to cleaning there. <laughs> just clean it up with your mouth. Do what I did no! when I played Portal 2 with Raymo. I just leant down no! to my desk and went... <sighs> no. Hygiene is important. But it's exhausting. It's exhausting for a good reason. I guess, yeah. Mm. I have an anyway, I have where an, were we? I have an interesting question for you. Ask me. Since both of you love, this is from uh, El Ita on Twitter. Since both of you love different genres of music, which song slash album would you like to recommend to the other, and what and why? The Fallout. Crown the Empire. It tells the story through a brilliant early 2010s metalcore of a world at the brink of destruction and the uh, like a rebellion rising up against the powers that be with nuclear war looming over the head of everyone, spelling the end of uh, civilization as we know it. But we don't know if the world is going to end or not. And... It contains a separate story, which is the story told over three st uh, over the course of three, 
three songs called the Johnny series, consisting of the songs Johnny Ringo, Johnny's Revenge, and Johnny's Rebellion, about a man who sold his soul to the devil for ultimate power, but ending up getting tricked, then attempting to rise against the devil in the depths of hell. And oh my god, two beautifully told stories through two fantastic concept albums and the thing is no 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 one fanta fantastic concept album and one ep then there's a third album called um the resistance the, uh, the resistance the rise of the runaway that takes place after the fallout it's oh my god please give it a listen it's some of the best metalcore the 2010s has to offer i in your drunken state, I was not expecting that passionate of an answer, but I'm very happy that I received it. I will be checking this album out. This sounds like a ton of fun. Mm. Ugh. I mean, I'm not much of a musical person, and so when I hear someone recommending an album with passion, it's like, damn. You know, it feels like different. For me, maybe a little basic, but for me, my recommendation to anyone would be uh, Carpenter Brute's Trilogy, uh, which, as a fan of Dark Synthwave, is kind of one of the main- Synthwave! Yes. That's a recent love of mine. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm really? Fr that... I'm freshly in love with Synthwave and Retrowave. That Synthwave is my all-time favorite genre of music. I fell in love with it not too long ago, like maybe five or so years ago, and ever since then, I have never been able to stop loving it. And I think that Trilogy is sort of the, I would say, maybe not the birth, but one of the main tentpole albums in the dark synth genre. And there are so Send many- Send me that stuff, my dude. So Send me it. So many iconic songs in this track. Have you ever played Hotline Miami 2? No, but I know Hotline Miami through reputation alone. Hotline Miami 2, most of the soundtrack is by this guy, and certain tracks like uh, Le Perve, Roller Mobster, and especially, I would say if you listen to one first, Turbo Killer. Oh my god. Something, something about this album, I can't stop listening to it. And if you can't get enough of it, there is a, another album, which is a live performance of this album, where they add a load musically to it. And I, if anything, prefer listening to the live album, you know, crowd screaming and all. That is a, something amazing I don't think get enough recognition, is the live performance of certain songs where changes are made on the fly, and sometimes it exceeds the album version. Mm -hmm. The best example I know Kikuo-san, really? a brilliant Vocaloid producer with vast knowledge in dark storytelling, like horror, like very, very dark subject matters lyrically, but fantastic EDM. He has a song called Tensho Sho Tensho, which translates roughly to Reincarnation Ascension. That is one of the creepiest, most unnerving songs that yet still happens to be a dubstep banger. There is a live performance of this version that it's like six minutes long that has such a creepy little bridge middle section into a never before heard outro version of the song that is one of the most amazing six minutes of EDM I've ever heard in my life. Holy crap. Voca Nico Knight was a gift to the world. It's... Sorry. No, no, go on, because it's something quite different than I would have imagined. Like, I've never heard of this album, nor this artist, and yet hearing your passion is infectious, and it makes me want to look at it for myself. I mean, that much... I know what you mean about like having this, it's this, it's having this eternal knowledge of a song where you've listened to it on repeat so many times and then you hear it in a different context and suddenly it leads somewhere you're not expecting. There's something like religious about that experience, you know. It truly grabs a mental pathway that's been made in your brain and rips it up and sends it somewhere else and like it... <laughs> 
There's something about that that I can't really quantify. It's so new and so different, and I I can't get enough of it. And so I'm I feel like I might have to check out this album. Hmm. I know what you mean. There's been so many albums I checked out just because of the recommendation of others, because of how they spoke about it. And every single time, whenever I've heard a friend whose company, friendship, and opinion I value, whenever I checked out something that they sang the praises of and said was genuinely like changing their perception of something. It doesn't have to be something major, but they changed the way that they view the world. Even if it's in some minor way, it's always been a, a very moving experience whenever I have given something like that a listen. Be it a song, an album, an EP, a movie, a show. Regardless of what it is, it's always been incredibly moving. And when I somebody's been recommending that to me, I sort of been like, yeah, I, I, I see it. Thank you for sharing this with me. This was clearly very special to you, and the fact that you wanted to tell me how special this is to you means the world to me. I guess that raises another question. What mm. is a work of art that is very special specifically to you? It doesn't matter how good you think it actually is or how widely celebrated it is. What is something that truly and utterly individually connects with you personally? I'm going to need to think about that for a second. That is fair. There's a few things. It's a difficult question. I need to figure out what moved me the most. I'm going to have to be honest. It is the storytelling works of Yoko Taro-san and the musical works of Okabe Keiichi-san. Incredibly based. Together. The wor musical works that they, and narrative works that they created for Drakengard and Nier have influenced me more in my storytelling ability and my compositional ability and view of music as it is than I can quantifiably describe as anything else. Yoko Taro-san and uh, Okabe Keiichi-san are... Th they genuinely changed me as a person through their works. I've never really... I played a tiny bit of Nia... And I don't really know much about, um, you know, that musical work. What is it about them that connects with you so much? Nothing I've experienced. This, like, musically, the soundtrack of Nier, especially the original. There's two versions of the Nier soundtrack, the original Nier. It is the uh, Nier Gestalt and Replicant that was released in Japan. Gestalt was released for 360. Replicant was released for PS3. In the West, we got the same version for PS3 and Xbox 360, which is Nier. It's just called Nier. And it features a father trying to rescue her, uh, rescue his daughter. In Nier Replicant, it's a brother trying to rescue his sister. The personalities of Father Nier and Brother Nier are very different, but overall it's the same story. And it's taking place in a dying world far in the future where humanity is at the brink of extinction of this supernatural force known as the shades and without giving too much away if you haven't experienced it that i am leaving a monumental button out that adds to the story that i can't tell you because i would rather perish than ruin this story for you the, the the brother near version near replicant has a modern day console and PC remake that is available on Steam right this instant, and because of that availability, I don't want to speak more on the story as it is. But the soundtrack perfectly encapsulates the absolute beauty of this world being reclaimed by nature as it's dying, 
as well as the sorrow of the people desperately trying to cling to life in it. It is not, like, just one song from that soundtrack elicits so many memories that bring me to the verge of tears within seconds. It is a masterclass in compositional storytelling. And it carries over to the sequel, Near Automata, that takes place 10,000 years in the future with technology and robots and everything. Whereas the original is more of a fantasy tragedy. I cannot recommend it enough. Alright. I clearly need to play this shit. <laughs> I think it would be the kind of story that you would immen immensely enjoy. Because I remember there have been a bunch of questions asked to us about... Because you've mentioned it on stream before, about your love of Drakengard. Mm. And how many people have asked how hard, how much would you want to force Vox to sit through every single Drakengard game to get to see the ending and all of that. Because I can imagine, given your love for those games, how much you would want me to not only see them, but for you to sit there and be like, yo, look at this, look at this, this is this, this is that, you know? The thing about Drakengard, the difference between Drakengard and Nier is that I can say that even with the flaws that the original Nier has, as opposed to the remake where a lot of those problems were like um, fixed, even with the original Nier, I can still say it is a competent game. It is a good game in the gameplay department. It is fine. I can't say the same for Drakengard. I uh -oh. love Drakengard. I, even with its gameplay, I love the gameplay. I think the gameplay reserves the story beautifully. But I hesitate to recommend it to people because of the game that it is. Because you're going to have to put up with a lot to experience the beautiful story that's kept within that game. What kind of stuff? Is it like sort of... Because I, I know what it's like to play a game that's like old, you know, and it sort of has it's sort not of that antiquated it's gameplay. It's, even when it came out, and uh, it's... it's uh, Dragon Guard 3 especially struggles with a lot of performance issues and a, a combat system that isn't the most deep in the world. I love it, but I know that it's difficult to recommend to people. When I say that it is not perfect, it is not stellar, I love it, but the general consensus is that it could be better. Mm. It's the same with the original Drag Guard, which was... Have you ever played Ace Combat? No. Okay, but the original idea for Dragon Guard, it was sort of like meant to be an aerial combat, sort of military combat, like, like dog fighting simulator, but with dragons and fantasy. But then Dynasty Warriors came onto the scene and blew the heck up and created the Musou genre as we know it. With one man or like one person taking on an army of hundreds. And they incorporated that into Drakengard. And that mishmash created something really unique that I love, but is not very refined. So a lot of people feel that it's a little bit mindless. But I feel like that services the story if you're killing this many people like genuinely thousands of people within certain stages you expect to be handed a happy ending no there's beauty at least i don't understand you know i haven't seen experienced the works of art that you're talking about but in my in my own sort of experiences i think that there is beauty in an unhappy ending because it can be truer to uh, the, our real experiences it can be truer to what a person is going through and i think that it's dishonest to ask that an artist give us a happy ending when maybe their own experience and their own relation to that art that they're creating is not a happy experience maybe they want maybe misery is a part of their life maybe Agony is something they want us to experience as well. And being able to relate and express a feeling of upset, anger, sadness, pain 
to the people watching is just as powerful as providing escapism because film and entertainment as a whole has provided nothing but escapism for a long time like oh you go to school you work a job you're upset you know you're tired stressed whatever here's some here's something you turn to rain, turn your brain off to for a little while that's valid too but art is a way of expressing something you know anything that you're feeling you can express through art in a infinite amount of ways and if that is turned off or sort of diluted then it loses its impact and that artist who went through those experiences has less of a way of sharing those with us the consumer and i think that that's kind of a tragedy you know mm. art shouldn't be made i don't think that in any capacity unless it's a massive studio project that needs to make money art does not need to be consumer friendly art is yes for the artist art is to be expressed by someone and we the consumer are blessed and lucky to consume artwork in any capacity even if it is the most inaccessible and ridiculous piece of art that we've ever seen even if it takes an immense amount of work to get all the way through we are privileged and we are blessed to be able to even access it because so and much no one to know what's on. beautiful about that kind of art some of that art delves into some of the darkest depths of humanity that we all know to be true, real, and existence, but we don't want to acknowledge it mm -hmm. because of how revolting and repulsive it is. But there are stories to be told there, and those stories deserve to exist. And the thing is with those stories is anybody can opt out of, I don't feel comfortable with this. I don't want to support this. I want to see less of this. I don't want this to exist. And you can contribute to that not existing by not supporting it, by not buying it. But the people that want that story to be told, that want to hear that narrative, they have the right to hear that narrative. They want to hear it for themselves and form their own opinion, regardless of what the subjects that the author decides to tackle. And I feel that that is just as valid as anything else, as long as it stays within the realms of non-reality. Just when you thought he couldn't get more based, <laughs> he just gets more and more based Ah, <sighs> Ike, this has been such an incredible experience. Like, likewise, I, likewise, holy I, crap! I never would have thought that after this much time of us being friends, like what, eight months now? Yeah, <sighs> it, it it actually passed uh, eight months just six days ago, didn't it? Yeah, just six days ago, twentieth of August would have been our eight months. It's only four more months until it's our one year. A year. Holy crap! A one year. Are you actually? Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, it's been exhausting, but it's been miraculous in its own way. Like what we've achieved and what we've been through together. Life changing in not only the sense of human connection, but everything else. The way that I view my everyday, day to day life. It is, yeah, my life hasn't been the same since Niji Sanji and mm. I wouldn't want it to be. Niji Sanji has led to some of the ge most genuine moments of happiness that I haven't felt for like years. Years upon years. And I, I feel the same way, you know, like um, you know, back a year, a year or so ago when I was living with my roommates, I kind of wasn't a happy person at all you know really and i've said this before i felt as though i had genuinely just 100 percent peaked in life like i would never achieve what i had achieved previously and that was that that was it you know and then being shown not just by niji sanji the company itself but also by the other members not just of luxium but of niji ian as a whole that you do have potential and you do have talent and 
you have the capacity to work hard and you have the capacity to make people happy. It's an experience that I wish more people, whether they watch us or whether or not, I wish more people would get to experience. And But knowing that they don't almost makes me feel more lucky in a way because I can't fathom how small the chance was that I would be here. And because I am here, I have the opportunity to live on my own in my own really nice place and to focus entirely on this new career and it's something that I don't think will ever stop feeling like a new career. It'll never stop feeling like a new experience that will never yeah. really get old, you know. Yeah, one of the things as me as a creative person, um, in my time, I wrote on a lot of novels. Some of them got fairly popular, but after a while it felt like some of those novels that I wrote people didn't flock to the novels that I wrote because I'm the one who wrote them. They flocked to the novels that I'd already written because of what was written in them. Mm. So when I wrote those novels and I wrote sequels to those novels because I thought that's what people wanted, it wasn't exactly fulfilling to me, but it's what kept people reading. And as long as people kept reading my works and getting joy out of it that's all that mattered to me but there was this hollowness because it wasn't the novels that I wanted to write it's the novels that the people wanted me to read and as much as a people pleaser I, as I am I'm still human I'm a person I want to be perceived I want to be appreciated for the things that I'm passionate about and Niji Sanji even though I'm not Writing as many novels as I used to be. First time in a long while. People are here because of me. And not because of what I do. And that's the most beautiful thing that I believe I could ever receive. So thank you to every single person. Be they mistakes, your minions, blue cubs, kindred, or quildren or anyone else in this world that spent even a fraction of a second watching me, Niji Sanji Yen, Niji Sanji, a VTuber, indie or corporate, if you spend time giving us the time of the day because we are us and not because of the things that we do, you will always hold a special place in my heart. Thank you. I don't know if I have any way of adding to that. That was really concise and poetic, emotional and perfect. And I don't think that I could express it any better myself. <sighs> Sorry, I didn't mean to get Oh, so don't you worry about it, dude. You were you were on the we, we are We've we've <sighs> we've, we've, we've we we are lost in the source truly and you are lost in the booze. The booze. The sauce. The, the booze. booze. The, 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 the booze. The sauce. <laughs> Hopelessly lost in the sauce. <laughs> I don't think I'm really able to top any aspect of that. And uh, we are already nearing four hours on this stream, which is by far the longest episode It doesn't feel like four hours, my guy. It doesn't feel like it at all. It feels like we've been here for 25 minutes, most. Mmm. Ah. Uh, it was a but delight to all the same, with you again. I am incredibly flattered, incredibly happy that you wanted to have me on your show, Logs. It is an honor and a privilege. It's a privilege to have you here as well. I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, we talk about the experience of joining Niji Sanji, but like us in Luxium, we met before any one of us was even remotely famous. And so we were just bros. And then all of a sudden we had fans, and all of a sudden we had followers, and all of a sudden we were a unit. And that is a strange experience because suddenly we weren't friends with the boys, we were friends with very famous people. And to me, even though they're my, they're my boys, there's still a part of me that thinks about how lucky I am that I get to call these people my friends. You know? Likewise. 
Come on, lean over, my guy. Give me a nuts. Well, let's have a little. Mm. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You come up. Mm. Uh, <laughs> mm. I, I love you, and I love everybody of Niji Sanji. I love you too, man. XID, XKR, JP, everybody. I love Niji Sanji! Ah, let's go! Baba Booey. Oh! Baba Booey. Baba Booey. I can't get enough of this experience, no matter how low the lows may be or how high the highs may be, it will always endlessly surprise me, and that will be worth me never giving this up. I just want to keep this going and to see what comes next, you know? Likewise. Likewise, Vox. <sighs> <sighs> what do you think? Should be this be a good place to round things off? I think so. We've ended it on a really emotional note. So guys, we have had a really successful and positive and emotional episode of Under the Table. I was about to say Under the Skin. Uh, there's, there's not... <laughs> Which, by the way, freaking based movie. Based Holy movie. Crap. Incredible film. Horror movie. Genuinely one of the scariest films that I've seen that it's also... Scarlett Johansson's best performance to date. Fight me. I Well, I would argue Marriage Story, but Under the Skin is also I'm, very I, I good. I know I love Marriage Story, but I'm sorry. This is up there. This nope. is up there. Fair enough. No, I agree it's up there. I agree it's up there. It's definitely what, like, like sort of neck and neck for me. But... A very one of my favorite episodes of Under the Table so far, and I am privileged and honored to have Ike Eveland as my guest. And it was wonderful to chat to you again in the barrage and the whirlwind of working as a liver for Niji Sanji. Sometimes we don't get the most chance to hang out and just talk as friends, but today felt like a nice chance to break away from that and just to have a nice little conversation. And I'm so glad that I, that I got to. You have been an, a wonderful friend to me. And I can't wait and to see you. You have been a wonderful next. host. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, 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 okay. Off we go to the abyss. We, off we go to the abyss. Thank you so everyone. much, Kindred, Quildren, so everybody much. that stopped by. Thank you so much, everyone. Kindred, Quildren, or other people who have been here to support us today. Thank you so much for supporting this show, and thank you so much for turning up, asking us questions, and just listening to us ramble about our interests in art, mu music, movies, whatever. It has been an incredible experience, and I cannot wait to see you next week with a new guest. Thank you so much. Everyone say goodbye to me and Ike Evelyn. Thank you very much, goodbye. everyone. I love you. Come on.